Matthias, good morning to you, sir. Um, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you in one minute, but I do want to mention to our 62-ish so far participants uh, that at yesterday's um, session number one, there were some intermittent, I believe, Teams-related problems that uh, cropped up uh, where folks were unable to either mute or unmute. In some cases, we had one presenter who was unable to get his audio uh, to work. I know in my case, while uh, attempting to mute myself one time, my whole Teams window shut down and I had to uh, had to log back into the meeting. So, um, so I, I hope today goes better. Um, and especially for the presenters and, and, and panelists. Uh, but uh, we'll, you know, if, if, if you're having problems and need help, please use the, it, while you're on the chat room to, uh, to maybe reach out and we'll see what we can in the background do to, to, to assist you. Um, on that note, Matthias, let me hand it over to you to uh, do the usual greeting and, um, and uh, going over the, uh, the do's and don'ts. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Friends and Partners meeting, the fall meeting that is focused on a technical exchange meeting across federal agencies that deal one way or another with aviation weather. And so these four days from yesterday through Thursday are really focused on trying to understand what is going on in the various agencies, uh, either use of weather to support aviation, which, you know, they have needs, which we need to be aware of, and research and development activities and operational matters related to producing aviation weather guidance, and what's the next thing coming down the pipe. So yesterday, we looked at traditional aviation and what's going on from a weather perspective. And today, we will look at aviation weather for advanced air mobility operations. And so just a little bit of bookkeeping here. Uh, the meeting is generally going from 11.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Savings Time. And the meeting will be recorded and materials uh, posted on the FPA website at the appropriate time after the meeting ends. On October 20th, we will have a planning meeting to discuss a uh, look ahead of what's happening on the spring meeting and uh, also an early look at next year's fall meeting. If you want to join us there and uh, make suggestions of what should be discussed there. By the way, uh, so you can also submit topics for future discussions on the FPA website. Please make use of that. Now for today's meeting, uh, Please mute your microphones if you're not speaking. This will really help reduce background noise. And uh, we are using the chat room, so submit your questions or comments in the chat room, uh, which will you know, help us uh, keep the panelists uh, focused on, on time. And once the appropriate time comes up for questions and discussions, then is Dave Strand again our uh, question master of the chat room, et cetera, or who is in charge today? Well, he, he's uh, he's up in your screen there, uh, Matthias. It's Brian Pettigrew today. Oh, okay. Sounds and, good. And, uh, and, and I've talked with Nancy ahead of time, and I think Nancy will probably run point on most of the Q&A with Brian as her as her backup or filling in any any other ones that that may have been missed in the in the course of the day. Okay, that sounds good, and that's a good cue to hand it over to Nancy Mendonca, who will be uh, the master of ceremonies for today's uh, day on advanced air mobility. Please, Nancy, take it from here. Thank you. So, um, thank you and welcome everyone. So, as Matthias said, was um, day two of our our technical exchange meeting. Um, Jennifer, if you'll bring up the slides, we'll uh, do a quick walk through the agenda. Um, basically, I've got it the day is structured with two sessions and two panels um, alternating. 
the ses the, um, the sessions will have um, kind of an overview. Um, thinking of the first one will be around operations in the lower altitude planetary boundary layer, um, that kind of um, advanced air mobility, urban air mobility um, trade space there. So um, I'll, I'll take the second slide. So I'd like to thank all the speakers from them. Um, I, I'm not going to do, I will do introductions by title, and that, but the full bios and things will be available as part of the slides afterwards. So if folks are interested in learning more about people, um, thank you for the folks who did send in their bios. And also, like I said, I encourage folks to go back and look at them. So looking forward to the great set of speakers here. Um, the, que the questions that I've asked them to talk to are there on the left. Um, looking for a little farther forward in the agenda, the, um, on the next slide, the first um, panel will be um, Steve Bradford and PK, um, or, or Parmal Kopardecker, for those who haven't met him yet, which I think are very few people, um, to talk about the future vision. And then the second session, we have a, um, a series of speakers looking at the current state of uh, what research is going on in the, in, across the federal government. And the last panel session, I'm really excited to have some great speakers to talk about, you know, the vi um, vision, uh, wrote challenges to get to the vision and potential um, thoughts forward from that. So looking forward to a great, um, great day and hopefully uh, lots, of lots of questions and lots of interchange. Um, on the next slide, the kind of goals I had were thinking about when I set the meeting up was to um, identify the stakeholders across the federal government as we put together research portfolios, you know, what are the stakeholder needs? Um, build awareness across the federal agencies about the different missions. I mean, we're doing a lot of public good missions out there. Hopefully we'll be able to leverage what each other is doing, lessons learned, um, and be able to provide much better services because of that. Um, start to look at requirements for that low altitude weather in the future so that we can shape, um, shape our research portfolios to, to build and, and need and um, satisfy those, re those requirements that we're, we're identifying today. Um, also just kind of start to look at a catalog, you know, quote unquote, of what research is going on so we can see what's being done, you know, where we can collaborate, where the gaps are, and have a much better informed um, research portfolio that each of the agencies initiates. And um, the last is to hopefully find if, if folks find value in this is to understand a better venue or continue here of how do we keep, you know, how do we keep this going? So hopefully we start something that folks find valuable and there's a desire to keep going. Um, I kind of got the seals along the right as, you know, as agencies become more interested and, and engage, we can add the seals and, and build maybe a potential community of interest. Um, next, my last slide before I turn it over to the first speaker is I'm looking forward. You know, I mentioned the community of interest. There's, some, there's things we can learn and things we could do. I think there's a lot of best practices out there. Hopefully we can pick up some of those and, and do, do what's needed. Um, we've written between NASA and the FAA a, co a concept of operations around weather and advanced air mobility, and, and maybe that will serve as our guiding light or our vision to shoot for. Um, I'm working to start assemble roadmaps and, and understand the trade space. Um, looking forward, like I said, I mentioned several times, research portfolios. How do we make sure our research portfolios meet the needs of the stakeholders? Um, we're seeing a lot more innovation across, you know, technologies, communities, ways of doing things. Um, hopefully, by this broader awareness that we're able to enable innovation in targeted areas. And lastly, as I could say, you know, roadmaps are, are aren't real good unless you keep them up to date. So hopefully, looking forward. Um, we'll find a bit, we'll find this valuable and continue it and, and keep a roadmap updated that people can come back to and understand and learn from. Um, with that, thank you very much. Um, I will keep an eye on for questions, but um, the format for today, like, like I mentioned, um, 10 minutes for each, nominally 10 minutes for each speaker. Um, I like this format. I've tried it before. Um, I think it's great because it reduces the burden on the speakers. And it, for the participants, I found I saw less Teams fatigue or <laughs> Zoom fatigue from that from this format. So um, hopefully folks will be flexible, hopefully like the format, and look forward to engaging and hearing comments and questions. With that, I will introduce the first speaker, Brad Kornitz. <laughs> and I, I messed it up from the Department of Interior. With that, over to, Brad, over to you, Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Yes, uh, I'm Brad Keckeritz. I'm the Division Chief for Unmanned Aircraft Systems with the Department of Interior Office of Aviation Services. 
Uh, my background's in uh, aviation, wildland firefighting predominantly. I uh, spent about 20 years um, on a hell attack cruise around the Western United States. And then along the way became an airplane pilot, flight instructor, and then took over the small unmanned aircraft program uh, back in uh, 2010 and have been pretty much full time uh, small UAS integration in interior uh, for the last 11 years. Um, our department is quite large. Um, we have uh, nine bureaus. Um, I'll just kind of run through some just so folks know what, which which bureaus belong to DOI because oftentimes we get confused with agriculture, but um, in Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, National Park Service, Office of Service Mining and Reclamation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and USGS being the kind of biggest of the bureaus that we have. Uh, we manage about 500 million acres of the of public land, which is about 20% of the land mass of the United States. But we also manage uh, the outer continental shelf and uh, the oil and gas interests there. Um, and we have conducted missions all the way from the Arctic uh, to um, a little tiny island called Palmyra Atoll, which is just basically in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we have a pretty robust aviation program. Uh, we do about 50,000, 55,000 flight hours per year uh, of manned aviation. And then uh, generally, uh, notwithstanding some political stuff that's been going on, our UAS program has been around 10 to 15,000 flights annually. Uh, when it's up and fully operational. Uh, we've got um, 89 total fleet DOI owned aircraft, 53 of those which are in Alaska, uh, prominently light fixed wing aircraft, and then 36 fleet aircraft in the lower 48s. Uh, we also have uh, up to about 1200 contract aircraft that we utilize uh, for either exclusive use uh, contracts or call and needed contracts. I uh, think firefighting uh, in the in the summertime where we have a surge capacity needed, we'll bring in those uh, those uh, call and needed contractors. We also have a lot of cooperators in the various states where we evaluate and inspect their aircraft for utilization uh, under our operational control. Our UAS program has about 853 small UAS and 568 remote pilots across 47 states. Our mission set is very diverse. We do lots of different kind of missions from firefighting to search and rescue, wildlife survey, offshore oil and gas, uh, transportation of inspectors to offshore platforms, evaluating geolog geologic hazards, hurricane response, marine mammal research, surface mining, law enforcement. So it's a very diverse diverse uh, mission set. As far as how we get our current weather observations, I would say the vast majority of our pilots are using the uh, digital data services, whether that's ForeFlight, the Aviation Weather S uh, Center, uh, Jeppesen, uh, 1-800-WX Brief Online, and then particularly in places like Alaska, we utilize the network of webcams to try and get some real-time intelligence of conditions in various places, especially those kind of critical choke points, passes, things of that nature where pilots can get into trouble. As far as what could be improved and what what's missing, in talking to one of my colleagues, uh, you know, we think one of the challenges in particular in the West and, and in Alaska is just the distance between um, observation stations and how you can have weather in between A and B and you don't know that it's there until you until you get into the area. Uh, the other issue we have significantly across the West and, and in Alaska and other places is connectivity. It's just the lack of available uh, network to get current data. So as things change over the course of a flight or course of a day or course of a project, we if we don't have access to data, then we can't get updated uh, weather products. Um, as far as improvements, you know, I think just a more robust network of uh, observation stations, but also for us as a more robust network in general in terms of 
covering a large geographic area with um, with a cell signal that we can get access to. Uh, the fourth question as far as how much of an impact would the improvement have on accomplishing our mission? Uh, Any time we can get better decision support tools, it's going to make us safer and more efficient and ultimately uh, save time and money. And so that to us is the biggest, obviously safety is the number one priority for us is ensuring that, that each flight goes off safely and efficiently, but you know, also saving money and, and getting better, better information. Um, one of the things, for example, with the small UAS program is, is the right weather conditions to collect the right kind of imagery in order to make map products and things of that nature. So, you know, the more accurate uh, the weather data is, the better the better data we can collect um, for our for our actual mission. Uh, then the final thing is, what would we like to get out of today's session? I think just kind of information gathering, learn what the community is up to, see if there's any any particular items that would be uh, of use to us or things that we're unaware of or um, networking we can do to to improve our overall mission. So with that, I'll take any questions folks may have about DOI. I'm not seeing any. <laughs> so, Brad, it, it sounds like you have a mix of urban ver and rural, but also ones that you can plan ahead for and ones that um, you need to do without a lot of notice. Yeah, so, yeah, we, in general, I would say majority of our missions are in rural or unpopulated or sparsely populated areas. We do have, though, you know, two helicopters based in downtown Washington, D.C. that fly for the park, U.S. Park Police. Um, so, you know, our, you're exactly right. Our missions are mixed between, you know, projects that are planned well in advance to emergency, emergency response, which is, you know, plan your flight in five minutes and get off the ground and go. That sounds great. Um, a question from um, Brian. What's Department of Interior's current UAS policy on flights, allowable platforms? So right now, um, we're, we're going through a bunch of machinations, mach, machinations with the White House subject or a, as a result of Executive Order 13981. Uh, the current policy is we're able to fly for emergency missions, uh, our existing fleet. Uh, we're still in a holding pattern on procurement, but we're hoping to get off of top dead center there shortly based upon the uh, the OSTP recommendations that will be going back to the White House. Um, so right now we're in we're in evolution mode as that those policies are finalized and we see what the final the final guidance coming back from uh, OMB is going to be as a result of those recommendations. Uh, as a percentage of flights, I, I, we're still very low. Uh, our UAS, you know, we, we, we figured we would have been about 17,000 flights this year before the uh, the previous administration's grounding order. And this year we're about 4,000. So we've seen a pretty significant decline in what we expected. But over time, I believe that, that we will scale up again. We're not typically utilizing UAS to replace manned aircraft. What we're doing, it, it, there are specific use cases where we do that, but in general what we've found is that the small UAS are a good supplement for either mission sets that are too hazardous to conduct with the uh, traditional aircraft or in, 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 in agencies and in projects where they don't have the resources to pay for a, a manned aircraft. So you know, your average science scientist that's doing field research needs some uh, aerial, aerially collected data. They can't afford a fifteen hundred dollar an hour helicopter, but they can, uh, they can afford to learn how to fly a fifteen hundred dollar drone. So that's where we've really seen the uptick in, uh, in our use. Um, Joe's question is Executive Order thirteen nine eighty one. Was the order that that we're working with the White House on. So we've been going back and forth at the deputy secretary level 
with our colleagues at, at Commerce and Justice and the Office of Science and Technology Policy on the final recommendations to the White House. And they should be getting delivered from the NSC to the White House here shortly. And then hopefully we'll get some further guidance on the path forward. Uh, looking at another question, what types of U.S. data, if any, and decision support tools versus processed by an analyst before sharing? Um, so in terms of, we have not only UAS data that gets shared, but we also have data that we collect, like our the NIROPS program, uh, where they collect uh, thermal uh, or infrared imagery from a line scanner in the back of an airplane, create a create the fire perimeters, uh, to deliver those down to the ground. In general, I don't have the exact numbers on how our breakdown is, but it depends on the type of the mission. A lot of the missions that we do from an emergency standpoint are kind of more ISR type missions where we are just out there trying to collect video imagery real time or near real time to inform decision makers on where fire is, a search and rescue law enforcement type mission. But we also have a significant percentage of projects where we're collecting thousands of images and, geo and then processing those images into a derived product. And then that derived product becomes the, the uh, decision support tool. So um, we collect all kinds of different stuff. We've got 37 different payloads that we've uh, approved to fly on various aircraft. Um, so it, it's anywhere from a aerial ignition device that we use for fire to a Doppler radar to, you know, a 30 times optical zoom camera um, to the ground penetrating radar. So there's a lot of different payloads that we've experimented with. Um, right, this is, I, I wanted to take you back really quick since you're talking about decision support tools. There were a couple questions up above regarding your weather data, particularly yeah. HEMS and GFA pages. Uh, I'm not uh, GFA, GFA. So, so Matt Franzek asks if uh, DOI operations uses AWC, HEMS, and GFA pages, and a very similar question about the sources of weather data used by the DOI UAS operators. What are Brian, you may have to explain the acronyms. So AWC is the Aviation Weather Center, and the HEMS tool is a decision support tool called uh, uh, Helicopter and Emergency Managed uh, Medical Services, and the GFA is the Graphical Forecast uh, for Aviation on the yeah. AWC uh, Tools page. Um, so, absolutely, the Aviation Weather Center. I think I mentioned that earlier. We, I'm sure, I know our pilots use that. Um, I think, in general, most of our pilots are using ForeFlight now. To be honest with you, um, it's a very slick tool. It's kind of all in one between flight planning and and um, and weather uh, data collection. Uh, we have some standalone risk management tools that we utilize that we, within our office. And I know our bureaus have some um, different models, the, the GAR model and some other different risk assessment models that they use uh, bureau by bureau. So I, I can't say for certain that all pilots use AWC, but I know that all pilots ingest and use the data that comes from that. Um, looking at Matt, I think I got all the ones above here. Um, Matt's question on what types and severity of weather will cancel your non helicopter missions. So in general, uh, IFR, we're, we're, we're mostly a VFR organization. So things that cancel a lot of our missions are, you know, just IFR conditions, uh, the other is smoke uh, in the wildland firefighting arena. We have a lot of days now where we have inversions or just really dense smoke from the qu quantity of fires that are happening. Uh, and in those situations, that's where really UAS has been quite helpful is that it gives us the opportunity to fly in those smoky conditions and gather intelligence and, and, and in particular use the aerial ignition system that we have on the UAS to conduct burnout and backfire operations and conditions that we typically would not, never not be able to fly in, which is in those extremely smoky conditions. So, you know, 
we're low we're we're a low altitude organization by nature. Um, very few of our flights are in in, in you know uh, class A airspace. So um, we're we live in the low altitude, and so we're subject to any of the typical restrictions on our ability to operate in severe weather, thunderstorms, things of that nature. Fred, thank you very much. Any last questions before we turn it over to Jim? Great presentation and, and a ton of information. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And hope um, hope you're able to join us for the rest of the the at least the session and and hopefully the day. So um, I'd like yeah. to introduce Jim. Thank you. Um, Jim Wallman. He's a meteorologist with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. All right. Uh, thanks, Nancy. And uh, uh, yeah, as uh, Nancy mentioned, I'm I'm a meteorologist here uh, with the U.S. Forest Service in Boise, Idaho, working at the National Interagency Fire Center. And so I'm just going to really focus more uh, from you know Brad talking about the overall more toward the the wireland fire side with uh, UAS. Um, Nancy, I didn't uh, send Jennifer a, a a short presentation if. If you can get that loaded. Okay. okay. Oh, perfect. Jennifer, do you yeah. you want me to grab it or you have it? I will be grabbing it momentarily. Okay. You can just uh, go to the the second slide um, if you want. Then Jennifer, when when you get it up, and uh, what I'm going to talk about really at first and kind of lead into it here is you know just talk about uh while on fire you just have different uh there's a typing system um where you know depending on the uh capability of the resource you're using uh can be you know type one uh type two all the way up to like type six uh generally i know uh, for uas we generally have uh type you know type one through type four uh is what we have uh the capability right now generally the the type one and type two are the larger uh larger systems and are run by contractors that are contracted out and then the type three and type four are very you know the smaller ones that are generally handled by agency personnel that are trained uh as to pilot the the crafts there and um so like the the type one and two in in general um as uh, brad was mentioned they can they can fly um, even when it when it's smoking and help to get some of the data. Uh, a lot of those are used help to aid in mapping missions, uh, detect heat near the fire line or in the interior, any spot fires um, outside potential containment lines or beyond the containment lines and help to identify any problem areas um, on on fires to help uh, target, you know, provide uh, information to the the boots on the ground, the people on the ground actually doing the firefighting and where uh, where they can be of most use and most effective as well. Um, so there, and then uh, as Brad was also mentioning, uh, a lot of the uh, the type three uh, run by agency personnel, they can uh, do uh, uh, firing operations, uh, dropping, uh, I mean, we call them ping pong balls, the little balls uh, filled with uh, ignitable fluid. So when they hit the ground, sun hits it'll it'll ignite and uh and start backfiring operations so that that's something that's capable uh one of the capabilities as well and then uh the other thing is too is uh there's also other projects kind of going on i know in 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 the agency are working on too uh so okay now you have you have it up uh if you just want to go through uh just go to the these are just the different typing like fixed wings and then the rotorcraft that are used uh, for the different types. And you can see by you know the the type capability based on endurance, uh, also the data collection altitude and their max range, kind of you know given the typing. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's just going to be one example. Uh, just as like one example of a of a type one. Uh, and just kind of giving the, the, the specifications on it, the performance, and then general the typical uses, uh, you know, just large forest support, the mapping, uh, mapping projects, and and things like that. It's, they're really used heavily uh, when you when you can get them on an incident for the mapping part of it. Uh, so if you go ahead, uh, actually two more slides, and go to the type three 
uh, example. Uh, this is a, just another example of, of a Type 3, kind of what, what it looks like. One of the rotorcrafts, um, they can be, you know, quadcopter or hex. Um, I think this example is a, is a hex here, the M600. And, you know, typical uses, uh, again, aerial ignition, uh, they can be used for mapping. And these generally, because the range is not as much, they are flown uh, pretty close to the line. You'll, you'll have uh, the operators, the pilots getting out closer to the line. Uh, so they so they can be within range and and conduct the operations from there. So and then uh, if you go ahead, uh, two more slides. We are working on other projects. I know when I was talking to uh, one of the one of the current projects is just uh, for airspace coordination. They're already uh, working with NASA, um, and so this is just really just uh, trying to get you know better understanding of. You know, because you're you're dealing in a very congested airspace and wildland fire, and in order to better coordinate it, this is something that was really import, important. So this is one of the projects they're currently working on. I think it's in phase one of three planned phases. Uh, and then going to the the next slide, one of the things I, I was talking about, one of the agency operators here is what what do they need? And uh, generally, they're looking for less than twenty. 20 knots of wind. And once they get above about 15 meters uh, above ground level, they're fairly stable. They use uh, GPS to help stabilize the system to account for turbulence. So it's it makes it a lot easier to fly. But of course, you know, in some areas where if you can get downslope winds, I, I hadn't talked to him about that. He had no experience with that. But I imagine in areas where you have extreme turbulence, um, it would still uh, not be able to account for it, I imagine, but I don't know for sure. But uh, you know, it's also uh, where do they get their their uh, observations? Um, in addition, you know, to using, uh, I know some of them you will go to the Aviation Weather Center, but they use uh, nearby remote auto weighted weather stations that are specific to wildland fire put out in remote areas. The Lunas National Weather Service spot forecasts uh, to get an idea of what's happening there. And then uh, on the larger incidents, if there's a uh, incident meteorologist uh, at these incidents, they will get information from the incident meteorologist you can, who will put, you know, provide their own site specific forecasts or aviation forecasts. So if we uh, go to the next slide there, um, just talking about the uh, incident meteorologists support a little bit more in depth and what they're getting. Uh, generally, they're going to be on the type one and type two uh, team incidents, occasionally on a type three. So, for example, a couple of the fires going on right now, like the KNP complex, the Windy Fire, um, are, are uh, fires that have IMETs, and so they can uh, help it. Now, the IMETs will give daily forecasts generally over the fire, but they also do other optional forecasts uh, de depending on the needs of the team and, their, and what's requested. Uh, aviation forecasts, um, which they'll, you know, go uh, generally. There's a, a form that we would use when we were on fires. Uh, it, it can be done, you know, every thousand feet, just temperature, humidity, uh, and and wind speed at e at each elevation. Uh, generally derived from model forecasts if they you know what they have on the fires, and then updates and alerts for any hazardous weather, um, whether it be strong winds, low humidity, uh, thunderstorms in the area, or even uh, working with the fire behavior and ex extreme fire behavior. Uh, that you know any large column development, they they will issue updates and alerts. And then what a lot of IMETs will also do is a, a program run by uh, it's Wind Ninja. It's a laptop wind modeling program. Uh, where you can ingest uh, other uh, models or, you know, just use a, a raw station to, as an input. And it'll give you a, a higher resolution up to like 250 meter uh, resolution winds, uh, surface winds uh, over the fire area or whatever location you choose. And that's de it was developed by the uh, Fire Sciences Lab in Missoula, Montana. So just kind of uh, next slide. Give a little bit more idea of what uh, IMETs are trying to do on the fire and what the needs are when you get into the the, the finer scale of the fire. Is uh, wind engine itself uh, your input can be uh, generally I just show a model, but it can be like a, a generalized area, or you can use a point source from like a ROS. But uh, some of the model options include the NAM, the three kilometer, the WRF ARW, the HER, um, and 
uh, and then downscale it uh, based on two solvers. You either just have conservation of mass or conservation of mass and momentum. So there's no real stability options in there uh, at all or, or any diabetic effects. Um, output you can put to either a Google Earth, which is shown here on the right, or you can send a geospatial uh, PDF for boots on the ground so it can be pulled up in, like, for example, a Venza Maps on, the, on a smartphone. Um, IMIS can run this in the field, um, or it can be done in the National Weather Service or Forest Service BLM district offices if needed. And again, the resolution is 250 uh, meters there. So um, really, so getting into the next slide, the last slide here is like what we're really looking for to kind of help IMS and what uh, UAS on the ground is really what we need is high, uh, higher resolution data of the of the fire environment. I kind of left that last bullet out, and then really high resolution and modeling of complex terrain would really be helpful. Uh, you know, not just the the winds as is done in Wind Ninja, but uh, something that will take into account the diabetic effects and also what's going on uh, in upper air, any turbulence aloft and things like that, especially since we're dealing with complex terrain on fires. So, and that's all I have. So, oh, any questions? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. From the fires, any lessons learned on interagency coordination from the fire from the fire center, or or I should say, what's the most obvious one um, of a lessons learned or best practice? Um, as far as what do you mean, a, like a best practice? As far as um, working working cross department, cross agency. Um, the really, it, it's it's something that's that's ongoing. It's really just. The, the 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 communication is really what needs to be refined so uh it's uh the the communication is really what's important and then doing after action reviews and things like that so um those are what's really important and, and finding better ways we can can relate to one another and each other's needs so um Sounds great. And i oh i have two questions if, if you yeah. can't see them i can read them I, I can see them. So I see, you know, what is the time between obtaining data and relating to firefighters? It, it depends on on what you're looking at. In in general, uh, it can be like the the general forecast. Uh, you know, you can be maybe you know six to twelve hours, uh, depending on what's going on. Like for the forecast for the operational plan, the overview on a fire can be as much as 12 hours old when the fires get it from when you produce it. Uh, but for the high resolution uh, events or, or uh, alerts and things like that, generally once you get obtain the data, uh, whether from radar or anything else, uh, you can get something out within five minutes over the radio or through a cell phone call and that will be over the radio. But the problem is you relay it to communications, they send it out and then there's a chain that it goes through. So even in a in a uh, you know a short uh, short term forecast that's a, a, of critical importance. Sometimes it can be as much as a, a half hour to maybe even 45 minutes to get it to the boots on the ground because uh, of the chain of of communication it goes through on the radio, and then any potential issues on the radio you know with because they're dealing with a lot of line of sight at that point. Uh, and so if if there's any uh, crews or, or resources in a hole, they may not receive it right away. It may take several uh, attempts before they're reached with that update. Uh, next question, how do you decide whether a small U.S. is safe to operate under the, uh, the experienced winds? Uh, that, that's not something uh, um, I, I decide myself. It's something that the user will based on their experience and, and what their guidelines are. So generally, they, they I, I know, um, one example I was given is that it any surface winds uh, 20 knots or greater they will they will not fly um, due to potential damage and, and lack of control at that point. Um, as far as uh, any feedback on the on the accuracy of wind engine information uh, in regards to gusts and sudden changes, it really the wind ninja is, is fairly accurate. Uh, especially in any areas we have like larger drainages, um, generally um, 
you know, as you get, you know, you have several grid points to resolve the drainage. Um, and as far as regard to gusts and sudden changes, that is not explicitly modeled. It's only generally the uh, sustained winds that are expected in the terrain. So um, it, it does do uh, a little bit better. The uh, mass momentum solver is generally better because uh, it will better resolve lee side effects. Uh, um, however, the it takes a lot longer to run, probably about 10 to 20 times as long uh, to run. So that may be something that uh, some, uh, some of us in the field, when I was in IMET before I moved here, uh, we would sometimes try to run those simulations a little bit ahead of time to get any uh, potential impacts uh, ahead of time and then to run just the conservation of mass. Um, so uh, that's kind of what we, we try to do ahead of time. Oh, sorry. I'm yeah, still go ahead. The questions. Can I tee them if if David is on? Um, can I tee the questions over to the chat? I've skimmed the participant list and didn't see David's name, so I'll give him a second to queue up and okay. either turn it over to him or we'll continue with questions. So, uh, uh, Nancy, this is Matt. Uh, were you referring to David Strand? And if so, Brian Pettigrew is your guy today. <laughs> no, um, David uh, David Warfield from ah. the, um, Homeland Security. Got it. Hearing nothing, Jim, I'll continue. I'll cue it back to you for more questions. Okay, uh, I'm just going on Brian's question, like how is uh, the Forest Service deconflicting UAS and airplane fl uh, flights and the fires? Uh, well, there's a lot. Um, generally, when you, when there's going to be a lot of aviation, there will be a, a temporary flight restriction re uh, issued for the fire area. But on the fires themselves, uh, there's a lot of communication uh, set up, generally run uh, by the, that's run at the, the HELA base to kind of help coordinate it. Um, and then there's also what's called a uh, air attack, um, which will be a, a fixed wing kind of flying over the fire. And th they'll be able to, to coordinate uh, not just the UAS, but also the uh, any helicopters flying in and out or, or tankers trying to, to, you know, manage the airspace. Um, and then in, you know, re very large fires, depending on what's going on, if it's going to impact other areas that there, we can uh, call the FAA to set up a, a, a temporary tower uh, for for a nearby airport such as uh, Reno Stead or or anywhere else that it's needed. Um, where should the higher met resolution models uh, be run? Um, can we run them in the field? Um, there, I know there's uh, the. National Weather Service in Monterey ha runs a, a WERF simulation of at one kilometer, uh, but they run it at the offices. As far as running it in the field, it'll be really difficult, uh, based on uh, you know computate not based on the computational needs uh, to run the high resolution uh, in the field, especially if you're going to be running it um, uh, over you know some of these larger fires that um, you know or over you know, 100,000, 200,000 acres. Um, so, and uh, so I, it'd be better run in an office or somewhere like that. There used to be, you know, the fire science lab used to run uh, a better version of Wind Ninja. It was like a wind wizard up there um, where it was done remotely. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they would do it for the field and you would have to request uh, different runs. So, that that's something I think might be the way to go because I don't know if any IMETs or anyone like that would have the resources to do it. And I, I guess the question is, how do you find high resolution? I'm looking at like really uh, 250 meters or less is what I'm looking at high resolution there. I mean very high resolution because we do have the you know the high resolution rapid refresh one at three kilometers to three kilometer NAM. Uh, that, that are available but looking really high resolution to help resolve some of these drainages that are are really mission critical in the fire so um and then one more question here just since fires can create their own surface weather how do you take 
raw uh, NWP output and create wind speed and or gust forecasts. Um, and then uh, since fires really do create their own weather, uh, what we'll do with the, the national, uh, the, the NWP output is we, for the fire itself, um, we, in those specific environments, when we look at the overall fire, we're not going to try to account for any potential uh, you know, impact from the fire itself. So um, what we do is when we start to see, uh, you know, larger fires or impacts, uh, I know San Jose State is running uh, the S fire model. Uh, for some of the fires, and that can be used as input because it, it will take into account what's going on with the fire. So if that is being run for the fire, uh, we can talk to them. But uh, as far as, you know, taking that output and creating wind speed or gust forecasts, um, you know, we try to downscale as much as possible in general. But as far as the fire, it's really, you know, taking knowledge of what we, we've learned in the past and experience and, and to dial that in better. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Looks like a great conversation on resolution on in the chat. Any other questions? That's great. No. Um, Jim, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can stay and, and contribute to the conversation and, and continue to answer questions with us. Um, okay, thank you. With, with that, I'll turn it over to James Gray from the um, U.S. Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway Administration. All right, thank you for the introduction. And I do have slides. I'm hoping they were received and can be loaded. I will talk in the meantime. I'm James Gray. I'm the UAS program manager from the Federal Highway Administration. Um, we kind of have two sides to our UAS program. Uh, one major side, probably the, the majority of what we do is the uh, oversight and funding for the national highway system. And to do that, we work with uh, 50 state Department of Departments of Transportation. District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. So we have 52 jurisdictions uh, that we work with to help them with their UAS programs through technical guidance. Um, and that's where the bulk of the UAS operations are happening right at the state DOT level where we provide some technical assistance, but it's ultimately in support of the national highway system that is state maintained, but federally funded and with uh, all the oversight that goes along with those federal funds. And the other half of the house is at Federal Highways, our direct federal program, where we actually build roads and bridges through direct, direct procurements on behalf of federal land management agencies, uh, Department of Defense, and even occasionally state DOTs. If there's a overly complex uh, technical project, they can use Federal Highway to directly procure the uh, design or, or, uh, and construction activities. Um, Nancy or Jennifer are my slides. I'm not, see, I'm not seeing the slides yet. I'm hunting. <laughs> okay. Hi, it's mom... Jennifer. I did not um, see any slides from you, James. Uh, maybe the file was too big and got hung up. I sent that over. Uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? I can do that as well. Yes, it should be possible. And we'll do that. Always goes the wrong side. All right. So we'll start off. Uh, that's me. That's my contact information. My background, just by way of introduction briefly here, is uh, 15 years in construction, did a lot of emergency response construction projects. Again, as part of that direct federal um, program uh, during emergency response events, we can support state DOTs getting roads and bridges and things of that nature rebuilt. Uh, quickly, and so that's where a lot of my background is. So the the sort of the rapid response nature of that let me 
uh, just get exposed to a lot of new technology and innovation. So that's what I brought to our headquarters office and now try to push that out at, in conjunction with managing our UAS program. So again, this is what we've done with state DOTs. We're working with every state DOT, uh, I'll say with 52 jurisdictions to uh, help move all the way through fully institutionalized UAS programs. And what I mean with that is generally the small UAS, the under 55 pound UAS, because most of our infrastructure is static. We know where it is uh, and the assessments we're doing are, are fairly pinpoint. The need we have for some of the bigger platforms would be larger surveying projects. Uh, that's not really the use case that a lot of state DOTs are, are looking for right now. So I'll just continue to kind of set the examples of what kind of work we're doing within Federal Highway. These are, again, breaking down. Uh, we have 15 uh, of the most widely used use cases within state DOTs, and these are all um, use cases that Federal Highway has provided technical guidance. Um, we've had peer exchanges, workshops. We have training programs to help state DOTs um, move these programs forward. And it's very interesting how it's structured. Um, some states have dedicated pilots who will go fly these missions for um, any one of these missions. Some state DOTs have added um, UAS as part of their surveying crew operations or added UAS to the bridge inspectors so that the user of the data is also the collector of the data. Um, and we kind of support whatever way they want to manage their data flow, uh, what we're there to kind of support, but ultimately it's not Federal Highway who's doing those flight operations. More, um, and just if anyone is interested, we all of our published information is on this website. So uh, information on the types of flights that we are uh, and, and research we've done uh, on the accuracy of the data, how we collect the data and all of those things would be located on this website. <clears throat> For me, the more interesting stuff is the Federal Highway direct uh, UAS operations that we do. Uh, and the use cases we have internal to Federal Highway is getting aerial photography and videography and topographic surveys are probably the most common. And we started to do a lot more <clears throat> rockfall analysis and rockfall change detection. Uh, and that involves a lot of steep slope monitoring, which is an interesting one because we're not, uh, we're, we're operating under 107 rules. So we're staying within that 400 feet above the ground, but our changes in sea level elevation could be a few thousand feet as we map a uh, a large rock face and you know move over a couple of feet you might move up uh, several hundred feet so we have some pretty decent elevation change in in short durations to get these steep slopes um, again a lot of the rural locations where we primarily work with federal land uh, agent management agencies uh, can be pretty mountainous and so that's the location we're working so a lot of wind variability there is, our, is probably our biggest concern. Some uh, planned use cases, again, we're trying to get better asset management data. So again, the large bridges and things like that can that involve some, some significant elevation change, especially uh, bridges over canyons and things of that nature. The, the wind created around the actual bridge members itself is, uh, is a large problem. The GPS denied environment where we can't rely on sort of that GPS stabilizing effect that kind of offsets as a minor wind changes is a problem as well. So again, wind is always kind of our, our number one uh, environmental enemy there. So again, I just to get some more perspective, we're not a uh, large UAS uh, operation. We have 12 107 pilots. Uh, we have eight UAS platforms that we operate on with. Uh, so we, we do not have a, a large fleet, um, but we are working in every state to where, where we have uh, operations to try to see where we can leverage this to get better asset data. Yeah, and as, as we're kind of, again, looking toward the future, our, our, you know, we really want to keep building out that rockfall monitoring and there's a huge cost reason for us to do that. There's also a large safety reason for doing that. We don't want to have our people um, trying to rappel down on stable slopes uh, when we can gather the data with combinations of LIDAR and standard uh, photogrammetry. 
Um, so from a safety perspective, even if it wasn't a cost benefit, we'd still be heavily focused on, on the rock fall and steep slopes. Um, there's, it's a major issue for a lot of infrastructure. So I see that continuing to be one of the largest uh, opportunities for us. And then uh, we also have some security issues that we'll continue to adapt to as, as new policies move forward there. So share all that just to share sort of a quick run through of what Federal Highway is working on and, and um, sort of the use cases we have. Weather-wise, we use um, ABC as well just um, to get the general local weather, data, but it's always in the hands of the pilot and command uh, what their comfort is because, again, wind uh, impacts especially are, are not going to be um, captured. Uh, that local wind is, is always our, our big problem, so we, we need to have a lot of flexibility on our pilot and command. What we generally do is send our UAS team out there as part of our um, technical team anyway, so it would be part of a survey crew or a bridge inspection crew, so if the wind is is not right for flying UAS the, for a survey crew, uh, for an example, they'll do their uh, they might do their traditional survey operations, set the ground control points, and wait for the next day to see if the weather improves to fly. So we're very conservative on our weather operations. Looking at the uh, data we collect, uh, photogrammetry, LIDAR, uh, our primary data product, products for surveying, um, for design models, uh, for uh, change detection is, is a big thing that we're looking at. You know, we use uh, depending on where we're at, uh, if we can get away with photogrammetry, we'll generally do that. It's a little easier to process than uh, LIDAR, sometimes uh, an overload of, of data. Um, again, ultimately we move those into, into the models um, for either design or for change detection are kind of our biggest uses right now. Uh, are there any other questions? And I was pretty quick running through our program. James, it sounds like between the your the own, the smalls that you also operate, but in co collaboration with all of the state DOTs, you guys have a really broad, um, I guess, capability to determine or to identify requirements and and leverage you know training materials and things like that. So quite a, a broad constituency, I guess I'd say. Yeah, and internally we may have you know only twelve, you know. Uh, 107 pilots, but we we work with several hundred when you get the community together, and we we definitely pull all the state DOTs together because it's in our best interest uh, to have some common operating uh, frameworks. So we're looking at everything from data frameworks so we can share data across. Um, you know, we work with even uh, metropolitan planning organizations or counties and how to get everybody to harmonize their data so we're not collecting the same data 10 different times. Uh, it has definitely uh, been a, a key focus. And then also from the uh, the consultant and contractor community, they appreciate some standard operating procedures so they can do business nationwide rather than having different requirements, you know, sometimes county by county and definitely state by state. Um, that, that's uh, not not in the best interest uh, economically to try to again collect uh, similar data in one location versus another. Thank you. Um, not seeing any questions. Um, appreciate it, and hope you can you can stay on if uh, if other folks have questions in the chat and in, and continue the conversation. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Travis Potter from um, the uh, Department of Homeland Security at FEMA. And, tra and Travis, I don't have, I don't see slides from you in my inbox. If you have them, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, are you guys able to see the screen I just shared? Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, my name is Travis Potter. I'm the UAS Remote Sensing Coordinator for FEMA Region 4. Uh, 
Although it's been said, uh, it's not true in regards to there being FEMA drones flying around. Uh, we don't currently have an aviation department. Uh, we rely on mission assignments with our federal partners and also with our state and local partners. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the collaboration we have um, with our uh, state partners to get their situational awareness for us and help with remote sensing. We have uh, seven UAS working groups uh, in our member states here in the Southeast uh, in Region 4. Uh, we've been collaborating with our partners since about uh, 2017. Uh, since we don't have an internal um, asset in regards to uh, UAS capability, uh, we partnered um, with our state partners to uh, cover down uh, during major events on situational awareness uh, data, also recovery data and mitigation data uh, in support of the federal declaration uh, so that we can expedite that process uh, for them uh, in support of the FEMA mission. Um, so not only do we have working groups and meeting to discuss uh, how to capture situation awareness, we also have exercises. Uh, prior to COVID, we were in the process of doing major uh, multi-state exercises. You see here, uh, we had one there in Alabama. We also had one uh, here in Georgia in the Smyrna area uh, that was attended by you know, most of the SLTT partners, uh, I'm sorry, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners who have UAS capability. Uh, so we could uh, help them figure out uh, how to go out and do damage assessments uh, and also to bring them all together uh, so everyone knows who has what uh, and also to help in regards to doing EMAX uh, between states uh, for resources if needed. Uh, since uh, COVID, we've had just a few exercises. Uh, we had one down in Florida. Uh, during uh, the June period, uh, we invited our federal partners uh, to participate as well. And uh, it went fairly well. Of course, a lot of folk were looking to get uh, out and get some stick time uh, out of the house uh, and go out and practice their skill sets. Uh, we have another exercise coming up here uh, later this month. Uh, Tennessee and uh, North Carolina uh, will be meeting there in the mountains uh, for a down plane exercise. Now, we um, solicit this data from our state and local partners uh, in support of products that are produced in the remote sensing cell. And here's an example of a product that uh, is, combines both uh, UAS imagery from North Carolina DOT uh, and also uh, Civil Air Patrol imagery. Uh, the product was produced by the National Guard UPADS. Uh, we also produce a product similar to this uh, within the remote sensing cell uh, utilizing UAS data. Uh, it's very important for us uh, to have this imagery because it helps tell the story, uh, it expedites the PDA process, and it helps us get money uh, to those folk who have been impacted uh, by the event sooner. Um, as many of you may know, uh, in 2020, uh, not just because of COVID, but because uh, we were looking for uh, other opportunities to advance uh, technologies within FEMA, uh, the preliminary damage assessment guide uh, allowed for the introduction of desktop damage assessments. Uh, that way we could use imagery uh, in support of the damage assessment uh, that's uh, done both uh, with the state partner uh, and the federal assessors. Uh, so with this guidance, uh, we've moved toward a virtual desktop damage assessment and we've been using that uh, this hurricane season. Uh, we've had great success with it and uh, we look forward to making it better. Uh, here's an example of uh, sort of what that virtual damage assessment looks like. Uh, we're able to um, take imagery and um, display it on the screen and have a look at it um, from a desktop. So we don't have to put assessors in the field uh, as often. Uh, currently, we're doing this in tandem with the manual process, um, but our hope is to move uh, further toward a virtual process uh, for the damage assessment. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, FEMA is also responsible for resource typing for UAS. Uh, we currently have three types out there, and that was done back in 2018. Uh, we've got a lot of feedback on that, so we are going to be making changes. Uh, these documents, of course, are living documents, so uh, we'll be updating this soon. And uh, just this year, um, Congress awarded the National Training Education Division within FEMA, uh, NTED, about $2 million to develop SLTT training uh, for UAS partners in coordination uh, with the FAA and also with the Center of Excellence. 
Um, we found it, um, here's an example of where we used UAS. Um, down in Surfside, um, most of the missions that were flown down there in support of both uh, search and rescue response and recovery efforts were flown by UAS. So this was really the first time uh, we focus primarily most of our resources on uh, UAS uh, to get situational awareness and uh, keep awareness on what was happening there uh, with the debris pile. So we found that uh, UAS is uh, probably going to be more useful to us uh, than we expected, and uh, we'll be focusing a lot of our remote sensing uh, capability on UAS uh, in support of our recovery response and mitigation missions. So uh, I guess I should go back and answer the original questions uh, with the time that I have left. Bear with me here. So I explained our missions um, and how we use UAS data. Um, how do you currently get weather observations and forecasts for this mission? Of course, we have our own internal meteorologists. Uh, we also rely on METARs. Uh, our partners also rely on uh, spot forecasts, commercial apps like UAV forecast, uh, aloft, air map. And of course, we have observed conditions and common sense. Uh, how could this be improved and uh, where you're missing gaps? Uh, well, uh, we are looking for better information in regards to weather uh, plus five to 12 hours uh, after a major event around the areas of uh, our primary concern. So wherever we have those areas of interest, uh, we'd like to know what's happening there a little sooner uh, in that locality. Uh, as you can imagine, if it's a major event and uh, it's multi-state, uh, that's a lot of areas of interest, and it's pretty hard to gather all that data uh, in support of search and rescue uh, and response efforts uh, in a timely fashion. So if there were a way to uh, pinpoint areas and get spot reports for those areas, no matter where they are, uh, when uh, communications may be a little sparse uh, because of the size of the event and the impacts, uh, that would be certainly helpful. Um, so I guess I already answered the improvement and uh, accomplishing the mission. Uh, and what would you like to get from today's session? Uh, I'd like to learn more about learn more about the options. You know what's out there, what's available, and uh, how we could benefit from the newer technologies in support of our response and recovery missions. Uh, that's all I have. Pending your questions, I'll answer one, or I'll ask one while folks type in. Um, Travis, this is Nancy. Are you seeing from the state partners an interest in predictive? Um, analytics. So, you know, the, understand that three inches of rain falls here. It's likely to result in a, you know, a flood or a, in a road um, being impassable down the road, or the, not down the road, but in a certain location. Uh, I'll say yes, but I'll give you a remote sensing coordinator answer on that. Um, there's always a model out there, uh, but having actual data to compare to that model so we can train them or help with the analytics is very helpful. So uh, I'm always a believer in, um, you know, show it to me and then I'll compare that to the model. Uh, so yes, I think there'll be a, a greater degree of um, interest uh, in that. Okay, so the, yeah, it's the data validation for the models. Okay, oh, great. Um, any other questions? Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can stay. I imagine a couple questions will come up in chat over time. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Brian Goulet from the Environmental Protection Agency. Thanks, Nancy. I'm going to share my screen, I hope. Let me know when you can see that, please. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks, Nancy. I want to discuss a little bit about uh, UAS operations at the EPAs uh, in general, but uh, with a focus on the Office of Research and Development and what I know best, which is emission sampling, and I'm starting to learn about plume dispersion. So uh, EPA, unlike a lot of our uh, federal colleagues, is really uh, just emerging from the, the dark ages uh, in terms of UAS use. Uh, we have recently uh, conformed to the uh, Obama request to 
to define a policy on UAS use. We've signed the directive at the end of last year, which discusses how the agency can use uh, and then the aerial systems. It has different components of uh, data management, security, privacy, civil rights, and financial mechanisms by which we can uh, use UAS. Of course, for us, for years now, um, drones have been sort of the third rail of science, and uh, this has been primarily related to the fact that I would say that the agency is principally uh, perceived as a uh, compliance and enforcement agency, and so uh, that ended up having a lot of privacy and civil rights concerns uh, that kept us from uh, fully utilizing UAS, even though we uh, had been allowed to. Uh, so uh, the, the main point I want to mention now is that um, the EPA is currently not allowed to even own or pilot uh, any kind of aircraft, which obviously includes uh, UAS. It also includes tethered balloons. So we're pretty much a ground agency. However, I believe this is changing. Uh, the directive had uh, and also the ORD policy just recently, I was able to get it changed. I, I was able to get the appropriation law changed. We can now utilize aircraft, um, but we are still not allowed to own any. So we have been able to uh, collaborate with uh, grantees, contractors, and other agencies. Uh, many of them are on the phone uh, call today uh, over the last uh, six years or so to conduct some uh, 19 different uh, UAS-based emission measurements. Uh, so, I, I, I checked the agency's uh, record of UAS flights, which is actually a new thing, and we have recorded so far 24 flights in the past uh, 6 to, to 12 months, uh, primarily in the regions. Uh, the regions have used UAS primarily for uh, site surveillance on uh, things like Superfund sites, uh, which might be mines, et cetera. Uh, Etc. So, um, ORD, my agency, which uh, the Office of Research and Development has only recorded three flights, and all of those are mine. So, uh, I'll focus a little bit on what we, what my group has used them for, and that's been emission sampling. I mentioned we've done 19 campaigns, and we've been very fortunate to team up with. Uh, folks across the uh, federal agencies, uh, NASA Ames, for instance, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, the Innovation Center, uh, Coast Guard, uh, RDC, the Research and Development Center, the Department of Defense uh, Strategic Environmental Research Development Program, uh, the U.S. Army uh, at several facilities, uh, including the Joint Munitions Command. Uh, we've recently done work with uh, NOAA. Uh, DOI has been a great partner. Uh, through the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, um, Desert Research Institute, and also uh, the University of North Carolina with their private partner, Atollo. And I've just shown here some of our applications that we've done since 2015. <coughs> uh, Brad and others mentioned uh, wildland fires. <coughs> Excuse me, on the left, you see a, uh, a prescribed fire, which was in Utah. Uh, in cooperation with the United States uh, Forest Service. This basically was a, a, a tree replacement or canopy burn, and so it's actually simulated a, a, a wildfire. Um, the bottom is the uh, <clears throat> recent flights done with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, um, the second of two, two campaigns this year, sampling in the Kansas Flint Hills. Um, uh, top middle, you see the Office of Research and Development. That's our Colibri. That's what we call our uh, sampling package. And you can see that it's pretty elaborate. It's strapped onto the bottom of a DJI M600 there, the platform that we've used uh, almost exclusively, but not quite. Um, we've also done work with uh, the Joint Munitions Command and uh, several Army facilities to measure emissions from uh, detonations. Uh, the picture on the top right shows recent work done in New Mexico. Uh, obviously, um, the emissions here, the measurements here are important because these uh, sites which are uh, tasked with demilitarization of obsolete or unsafe ordinance are limited in the amount of ordinance they can process by emission measurements. And uh, for the first time uh, in 
we've been able to actually measure these emissions using drones. Uh, the bottom right is actually some work done with uh, the U.S. Coast Guard uh, Research and Development Center and their pilots there. You can see them in the picture measuring plumes from uh, measuring emissions in plumes from uh, oil fires on water. So those are some of the specific applications my my team has worked on. Uh, we have uh, an upcoming uh, plume dispersion project I'm very excited about. This is a a project uh, joined by uh, the NOAA modelers, um, uh, Department of Interior, BSEE, um, EPA's Office of Emergency Management, and the USGS um, um, uh, flight uh, pilots. Um, so we are going to actually um, do transects through an oil fire plume, as an example, to um, measure the dispersion, the local dispersion of these plumes and NOAA is going to use their high split dispersion model to uh, calibrate and improve the model. Uh, I think this is really exciting. This is a, a real game changer because this is the first time using, UA, using UAS or any platform that we've been able to obtain these, these 3D spatial and temporal data of uh, emissions. And so we'll be able to use those emissions, uh, put them into the model, and uh, predict uh, downwind dispersion and uh, hopefully inform uh, on-scene coordinators about the potential for hazards to uh, workers in the area and the downwind public. And obviously I, I wanted to highlight this project because it's probably the one that requires the most uh, um, critical data on weather monitoring. Uh, so obviously I can measure the emissions extremely well, but uh, what I can't do so far, and this gets to some of our needs, is to be able to predict the meteorological conditions at, at elevation and near the site. Um, so this is sort of a concept, this diagram here is sort of a concept of what we hope to do to, uh, disturb, to determine the dispersion coefficients throughout the plume, uh, both uh, horizontally and vertically, and then to put them into the dispersion model. So this is probably our greatest need right now for uh, uh, local weather data, which obviously won't be helpful if we're looking at uh, uh, automated weather data from a, a weather station miles away. So uh, this is a project we're hoping to, we'll probably be doing at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks at their Poker Flat Research Range. Um, this picture on the right is actually the Mobile Bay facility, but um, we'll be doing an oil burn on water. Uh, I mentioned the participants uh, earlier, and uh, we're, we're particularly looking for a, an ability to improve our localized meteorological data, because once we have the, the fine detail on the emissions, uh, obviously the thing that will be most uh, lacking then at that point is these uh, local meteorological data. Uh, and I mentioned some of these, these uh, parameters below lapse rate, wind velocity, turbulence, et cetera. Um, yeah, um, again, some contacts if people have some ideas and thoughts and would like to uh, collaborate on the project. Um, I, I'm quite interested in that. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a Part 107 certified pilot, but uh, since my agency as a whole has us grounded, uh, I'll have to rely on others, and I, I believe that'll be from the uh, good grace of the U.S. Geological Survey, their pilots will be flying with them again. Uh, Nancy, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for Brian? Either warn everyone out or... <laughs> I think I just answered everybody's questions. That's, that's all. No, um, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Um, hope you can stay on a little bit longer with us. And with that, I will turn it over to Austin Cross from De um, National Weather Service within the Department of Commerce. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon. I, I don't know if my screen sharing is working there. Yes. Okay, great. So a little bit different uh, in that we're um, not so much a, a user of 
uh, the weather data, but more a creator of it. So a little bit of background about us, the Aviation Weather Center, part of the National Weather Service. We have a, a large staff of forecasters that produce uh, aviation forecasts and warnings, both domestic and international in, in partnership with the UK Med Office. Uh, we also operate a, the aviation weather test bed to help facilitate research to operations. So trying to pull um, you know, more of the, the cutting edge things into our operations, get them out to users. And we also operate aviationweather.gov. So kind of going towards the question of observations and forecasts, we, we do move a lot of data. Uh, we're receiving, you know, observations from, from the ASOSs and AWOSs out there, but also Mesonet data, international observations, uh, of course, the NOAA computer models as well as international models to both benefit our forecast, but also to help disseminate that information. And we also facilitate uh, the entry of pilot reports so people can go onto our website and enter a, a pilot report directly there and get it out to all users, not just on our website and our forecasters, but out to the world as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have forecasters that are, are publishing warnings, advisories, forecasts, and also displaying all this information on our website, aviationweather.gov, which I'll talk a little bit about more, as well as sending out raw data. So, so there's been some discussion about four flights in the chat. Um, definitely they're using some of our data and it's becoming more of a thing, I think, that uh, various end user groups, whether it's uh, private companies or uh, perhaps uh, agencies developing GIS portals, wanting to work with some of that raw data. I know there's a big push within the FAA to get more of the, the data so that it can be repackaged in the ways that work best for users. And we definitely want to help facilitate that. Specifically, though, for low altitude users, we operate the HEMS tool, the Helicopter Emergency Medical Services tool that came up earlier. Um, this has been around since about the year 2000. It went uh, operational just maybe five years ago or so. And the, the idea to have one tool where you can get uh, all the weather information that you might need, whether it's observational, uh, you know, from the um, METAR stations or satellite radar data, as well as model data specifically targeted for that surface to 5,000 foot level uh, to really serve helicopter users. But also, obviously, we're seeing a, a huge increase in UAS activity and using some of that data. We definitely understand things can be improved. I think that's one of the things that I'd like to get out of today's session is, is hearing from the, the different groups that it's it's been great to hear what our government partners are up to in the field of UAS, understand their needs better. Uh, here are a few of the themes that we've kind of picked up over the last several years of things that we need to work on. Uh, definitely hearing a lot for, about the need for mobile that folks are using tablets and phones, whether it's, you know, on the go on, on the way to the airport or, or whether it's actually in the cockpit, especially uh, helicopter operations near the ground, actually able to, to get reception, but can definitely see how you're out in the field with UAS and um, also have your mobile device there. You don't want to necessarily call back to um, uh, head office to get that information, but to be able to get it on the go. thought it was kind of funny in the um, Apple product launch of the new iPad mini last month, they actually highlighted aviation use as, as one of the, the key users of that, that form factor of tablet. Uh, we also want to increase the accessibility, make things easier to use. There's a lot of information on our website spread across the so many different pages and packaged in different ways. We want to make it easier for users to get directly to what they need to accomplish their mission. We want to have a more consistent uh, picture so the decrease the number of different depictions of the same information have, have one way to, to get at it and be able to overlay with the other information you need rather than um, 
having to pull together different sources and also increase the consistency of the say the forecast message itself that working better with the, all the different offices within the national weather service to have you know one forecast and not have uh, any disagreement that can lead to confusion and then take advantage of the improved numerical weather predictions. So there's been discussion about uh, higher resolution modeling going down to sub one kilometer. That'll be a, definitely a big challenge for us to try to get to that level. Um, but you know we're seeing things like the the new regional ensemble model that's going to be coming out of the National Weather Service in a few years. So really want to hit the ground running with that data. Uh, have it. You know, not only the, the data directly from the model, but also the, the various post processing to deliver things like uh, turbulence information derived from the, the winds within there. We also operate the aviation weather test bed, so helping to get this uh, cutting edge stuff into operations, but also uh, it's been an increasing focus of closing the loop with the end user, so getting feedback directly from uh, pilots and dispatchers and, and folks that are flying UASs um, hear directly from them about what they need, what what they're struggling with, uh, and so so meetings like this are especially useful. But um, the more that we can get folks involved in some of our evaluation activities as we develop new capabilities, make sure we're on the right track, make sure we're meeting the needs, and we do this in collaboration with the FAA's Aviation Weather Demonstration and Evaluation Services Group. So they're uh, human factors experts that can help us understand uh, how the users are, are taking advantage of our products and services. So with all that in mind, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the last year on overhauling our website, making it more mobile friendly, trying to uh, develop it so that it, it works first and foremost on mobile devices and then scale it up to desktops. Uh, you know, more than half of internet traffic these days is actually through mobile devices. And, you know, there's there's no reason to develop uh, a website that, that works at a desktop and then struggle to use it on your phone. We want it to work across all platforms. Uh, and more importantly, for low altitude, trying to combine our successful GFA, the graphical forecast for aviation tool that offers a, a great one-stop shop kind of framework to view forecasts and observational information, combine that with the HEMS tool so that you have one place you can go and get all of that data so that um, get get the overall weather picture and then move on to the the specific needs about a particular altitude you might be flying at. So this has been one of our our key focuses. We haven't done a lot of work in the um, uh, the the existing HEMS tool, saving that up for this new website capability. So we're, we're still using the old name of, of HEMS, even though that community is evolved into helicopter air ambulance services but we also want to encompass the the larger community that obviously goes beyond helicopter usage so here's just a few screenshots of what the the site is looking like at this time it's still very much in development but we hope to have this experimentally available next year uh, and then you know see how the user evaluation goes and probably a year after that or so have this capability um, take over the existing website. And uh, I believe that's all I have at this time. So I got my contact information there and definitely happy to take any questions that folks may have. Any questions for Austin? I'm not seeing any in the chat. Austin, th um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see a comment about uh, NASA ATM testbed. Definitely, we're we're all uh, all on board for cross testbed collaborations. So please do get in touch. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll connect w w with you, Austin, and um, it, it would be great to kind of showcase how the future uh, aviation will work with weather resilient operations. So. 
as we are looking at uh, entire small drones all the way to commercial space launches and hypersonic, subpersonic, and urban air mobility that Nancy leads. So looking forward to, to, to having that conversation. We'll, we'll work through Nancy to set that up. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And I see a question from Tom George about the, the change of the, the name. Yeah, we've sort of been saving up the name change. We, you know, we understand uh, helicopter air ambulance is the, the term for that specific community now, but um, we're, we're really excited about this kind of overhaul of the, the broader website. And so changing it to not just be the, the, the HA tool, the HAA tool, uh, but to make it GFA low altitude, to make it more uh, encompassing of all the different users uh, in, that, uh, in that space. No, thank you. So that concludes this um, the session where we're primarily focused on operations. And with that, I will cue it over to PK and I will let him introduce himself. If, if anybody by chance doesn't happen to know him already. And I'm hoping Steve Bradford has been able to join us. I haven't been able to scroll down through the um, attendees list, but um, Steve, if you're on, please join us. I'm here. Oops, excuse me. Come on, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much. So um, I, um, I pulled together two luminaries in the field to hope um, to talk about the um, vision and thoughts of the future for aviation weather. So thank you both for the time and joining us. PK, you're I'm muted. Actually, thank you for inviting us. I think, I think I'm thanking you because I, I I got on for like 15 minutes and going, well, why are we here? But anyways, um, I, I guess, I guess why we're here is because we're 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 concerned. We're not concerned. We're we're looking for opportunities to in, increasingly improve the low altitude weather for those who need to have observations, etc., based on our current rules. Um, does every vertiport have to have an ASOS or what do they have to have? Or can we can we get to some sort of um, crowd-based sensor, performance-based conditions at places? And that's the kind of thing we worry about because uh, I just remember that our, our typical certified sensors are not all that cheap. And do I need, you know, how, how much RVR do I need if I'm flying Below 500 feet, or what do I need if I'm staying below three or four, three or four thousand feet? Uh, does that does your previous actually give me what I need if I'm flying in that range? And I don't know. I just I see if AM takes off, we'll have more and more points of departure and landing for commercial operations, and I'm just concerned that. Can weather keep up with all that demand with at a cost that doesn't inhibit the industry? Or if God let's hope not, the FA is required to provide resources at all those vertiports. So that's kind of where it's one of the gaps I see. This is um, a clear, constant picture at the low altitudes for for our operators. PK, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, as uh, as we are working with collaboratively with FAA, FAA has one initiative for infocentric NAS. One of the big um, delays in the national airspace system. Twenty five percent aircraft get delayed. Out of those, seventy five percent get delayed due to weather. And as we are increasing the diversity and density and scalability and aviation everywhere all those wonderful mantras, we see that weather will continue to be a interesting aspects to ensure resilience of aviation. So based on the current delay statistics, I think we need to take weather seriously and as FAA's infocentric NAS uh, perspective for 2035-ish and NASA's future vision 2045 and beyond, 
we need to figure out how to integrate the weather information, provide <clears throat> and get third party service providers to generate weather data, weather predictions at the lower altitude at the places where we don't have a good understanding of weather through some novel means of weather predictions and then share that information. It's all about sharing and caring about airspace users. So I think it will be great to figure out how to, as Steve was saying, crowdsourcing, collecting the data through novel means, predicting the models, and then sharing that information for everybody's benefit to ensure the safety and, and also reduce the demand capacity imbalance for future. So, um, Nancy, how close do I have to stick to small UIS or AM? You don't. I, oh, it's always great to hear from you and, and understand the, the thinking well, so, of the so, agency going forward. So here's, here's one of those things that I don't understand, um, and maybe you all can fix it for me, is uh, what is the end goal for our collection of, of weather information from the aircraft? So um, and I'm going to bring up my favorite topic because I'm sure there are people on here, uh, pie reps. I want to improve the ability to get good pie reps. Um, is my goal to to uh, have thousands of pie reps, which are then sorted and then provided to pilots, or are the pie reps really the end goal of pie reps is to improve your state of the atmosphere model? I don't understand. And so, if it's a state of the atmosphere model, I constantly am battle. I'm constantly, and you're getting better. I'm constantly trying to figure out how do we actually provide better information to pilots. So when I get back, to, and then I'm going to take myself turbulence now. How do I, in the AAM world, how would I describe turbulence, which I actually think they'll probably experience quite a bit of it. How would I, how would I describe turbulence from one pilot to the next if, if I collect the data? And should I collect the data? And how would I collect the data? Um, is it, now though, the AAM crowd will probably have ADSB. Do I count on ADSB? Am I am I trying to collect some other any ad dissipation rate? What is our goal for AAM to provide like turbulence or or icing? How do I collect the icing? Um, I I think we're we're still struggling with how to help GA, um, and they tend to be a little higher. What am I going to do with the the two three thousand footers in the city? Because they ain't going to get much higher than that if they're flying into Class B airspace. So I think that's a gap. Um, I, I'm still fascinated, and I want to get back. I'm still fascinated by pie reps, which to me are like procedural separation. Is I get humans to tell me their best <coughs> estimate, and I notice that we don't do procedural procedural separation very many places. We figured out how to um, move a step beyond. Do I really want pie reps? And if I do, do I really want to put them in? Do I want to adjust them and put them into another product, or do I really want to give pie reps back to pilots? Um, what is our end goal? And I don't know. Um, I'm I'm constantly struck by we try to get better at what we do today um, because we've always done it. Is that the real end goal here? And those those are kind of th things I think about when we get to infocentric. Um, yeah, so if somebody's telling me they have both a tactical and a strategic. Okay, who actually who actually makes sure that pie reps are passed on to other people today? Or am I using the pie rep to to help fill out my my uh, picture of the atmosphere? Uh, is there a requirement for? Uh, is there a data feed for everybody to get the pie reps and do I filter them like notums or what, what's my end goal? Uh, high altitude airlines will share pie reps over a cars with the airline. Uh, where do they get there? Uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not discounting pie reps as a gap filler, but is it pie reps or is it the gap filler I want to really want? And those are the kind of things I, I concern myself with because with machine learning, with natural language processing, we can actually convert that into usable data and build it into our into our models. So what is our end goal here as we go forward and try to get to an infocentric? I like I'm still worried about the 500 feet below uh, to 
who has to who who says that weather is good enough or are we going to come up with some performance based standard where if somebody pro can provide the weather to meet a standard, we qualify them to provide the weather. I'm just curious. And these are the kind of gaps I wonder I worry about. Um, Bill probably will tell me I'm worried too much, but. That's where I'm at. PK, what do you think? I think um, the work that's done by industry and the novel prediction models, as well as the UREP type of activity we started. So sort of instantiation of PyREP, but for unmanned or automated systems is, is one option to consider. So if we have automated systems, then it gets digitized, it gets sent into a repository or in a cloud-based platform, and then that gets distributed or be accessed. So I'm wondering, you know, so we we put together this concept called UREP, which is sort of instantiation of PyREP for small drones, but I, there is nothing that prevents it from being a automated uh, representation, collection, and then distribute redistribution. So, and I, I see the comment that we we brief pilots daily using PyREPs. Um, if we could build that with other data, which we just heard about from National Weather Service, wouldn't that be a better picture? Can I use PyREPs to kind of validate and fill in gaps? Or do do we really want, we're taking the content from PyREPs, is, is a verbal briefing the best way of getting that back to people? You can tell me. I mean, I just have, I just sit here and ask myself questions because perhaps pyreps at low altitude are different than pyreps in at higher altitudes. But uh, I, I have, I have. Let's see. Uh, I think I count five initiatives on pyrep within the agency, and I'm not quite sure how they all link together. And so I, I ask myself these questions, and these are my gaps. Um, and that's what it, that's what a chief scientist does. He he says, oh, how do all these things fit together? Um, and I don't have the answer, but uh, I wasn't here to give answers. Steve, we're seeing ta um, talk about putting sensors on, particularly the SUASs, um, to support weather um, current observations. Do you see any roadblocks to being able to do that more ubiquitous, uh, ubiquitously, and then being able to use the data? Well, I, w I would think that um, there are certain observations they can do natively if they have basically the heart and soul of many of these machines is the cell phone and the cell phone actually does collect some observations and you know that they can have accelerometers. They can do things they could actually collect data even with the current technology. Now, could, should we expand it? Potentially, um, they probably don't do a very good job on t temperature and humidity, but OK. Uh, I think the AM crowd definitely we should have expectations if they wish to fly other than VFR and IFR expectations that they that they contribute to weather because they're going to want special operations. Uh, do I try to do something in BV loss? Is it turn out does it turn out that the BV loss perform performance really needs better weather and do then I, I I add contributions? I don't know. Those are all good questions we should need to ask ourselves, especially in BV loss, rather quickly. I also think that the vehicle characterization as to which wind conditions the vehicles can safely operate. So we have seen, like particularly small drones, uh, in in Reno when we were doing testing at 5,080 feet or so, and we had a headwind and with 98 degrees. All of a sudden, the battery could go barely quarter mile, you know. So, BV loss was what was expected, but it, we, we couldn't do that. Uh, the wind, can, wind, and the air density and hot temperature really made a significant impact. So, understanding the impact of the weather and environmental conditions on vehicles' performance characteristics is something really critical, and that's something we need to have system ready before they depart so that we know whether the mission is going to be completed or not you know so so um, i'm getting all these good these good comments so clearly i've i have scratched an itch here or something 
Um, the other thing that I think we need to consider going forward is that, um, and this is a mass, this could be a massive amount of information. So do I back call it to some giant uh, supercomputers sitting in College Park, not more than a mile and a half from me? Or is, do we actually take care, do we start looking at more edge computing for the local forecast? And because in the 5G, we should be able to support um, quicker local local computing and then the results, some of the results get back hauled to the big models. I mean, um, so and that has to do with the observations. As far as the PI reps, I'm, I, I'm, I understand PI reps. I understand the need to get the information, but is the representation of the information best as a pilot report or can we use it or are we trying to fill out our state of the atmosphere models that we're also building through the other things? What is the consolidated picture? Because I heard that our goal is to have a consolidated picture of the current state and the future. But now I have, so it, is it important to keep the disparate sources and tell people about the disparate sources? Or do I need to figure out how to combine all this into this unified, better picture? And that's what, guess what I'm asking. Is my end goal to oh. reread mm. PIREPS or is my end goal to have a an improved state of the atmosphere picture? Uh, um, a question from Dave Kochevar. Dave, you want to come off mute and ask? Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Wonderful. And you're gonna you're gonna school me, so I'm happy. Oh, I don't know about that. I just have, just have some thoughts based on the the questions and the point you made. Um, you know, so I think the back to your initial question on this. I, in my opinion, the end goal here should really be a true end to end modernization of the PIREP system. So starting with automation with air traffic and the creation of the PIREP to to support a significant increase in the amount of pirates going into the system and modernizing the type of information that we can put into a pirate to include potentially pictures or video or adding this edr type data or any other in-flight type data to the pirate and then the reason i say end to end is that would require a pretty substantial um modernization on the dissemination piece to add this significant amount of information to that pilot report but i think it's a great point to where you know if you look at the pirate system as we have it today it has gone through very little modernization in the 10 plus years i've been working aviation in alaska here and so it's a it's a very critical uh, service that both we need as aviation forecasters, but also the operators and the pilots, you know, desperately need the information in the pilot report, but they desperately need more information than what's currently provided in there. Okay, and so I, I apologize because I, I do realize that Alaska is a, um, is not a rich multiple source of data as you do have in the, some of the lower 48 environments, right? So then the question is, is you really, you call them a pi rep, but do you really want to, you want to have it some so automated, you really want to link, you want to link aircraft data with the pilot's observations? Oh, I, I think that's one way, um, you know. Because, you, you know, the, 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 the pilot's going to give me an opinion on the turbulence, the EDR is going to give me a, a measurement. And so, Am I trying to collect? So am I collecting both the human and the machine's observation of the current location? And automating it would be good because then you don't you're not guessing where the location is. Correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know the technology is certainly there with a lot of the this you know in in flight screens, the use of iPads, you know things like that. The you know simple information as to um, time and location you know is 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 really really already available however if you look at the whole pirep system as far as the life of a pirep and how it's still produced today in 2021 it's still very you know 
pilot gives specific conditions over the radio to air traffic, which is written down on a piece of paper, which might go through three or four sets of hands before it's publicly disseminated. So there, there's a real need in there for, for true monitorization of the creation of a pyre up as, as I, I think an important first step, you know, before we do anything regarding automation of in-flight data or anything else. I, I think the, the first step here is just taking the system we, that we have right now and trying to get a faster end-to-end -end creation of a pyre up, I, I think would be a huge, huge help in both supporting the pilot and the air traffic controller trying to get this into the system because that's a huge workload on their part okay well I, i'm sorry i took us into pie reps because that's been my latest that's why <laughs> as randy basilty that's my latest my latest crusade is trying to figure out pie reps but um, i i also i'm also interested in about um local forecasts for and i'm talking you know you know uh two three miles four miles of airspace where somebody wants to be operating either, um, which is beyond visual on the site, by the way, since what's that's 400 feet. I mean, where they want to operate maybe an inspection, et cetera. How do I get them better inf weather information uh, about what's occurring three miles away, et cetera? Um, because we know that we know that local conditions, especially in the summer, are very local, especially on the East Coast. And so how do I how do I help them understand what's coming before they they look at the uh, the uh, next red mosaic and see that there's a big storm that they just flow into? I mean, how do we how do we improve that for these operators? So can, can we uh, can, can we uh, actually what, what get way? to local local sensing or local was, observations and local computing? This is uh, Don, I've had my hand up. I'd love to answer your question, Steve, or help you answer it. Good, answer my question, Don. How are you doing? Uh, clearly, I, I'm just spitballing here. Yeah, so so I think P, PK and, and uh, Steve, I think the first thing is important to recognize that we've been looking at this, not just true weather, but the group has been looking at this for about three years, right? We, we understand, you know, the BV loss challenge is coming up, right? And, uh, you know, pilots supposed to have knowledge of the weather they're flying in, right? Which is impossible if you have a drone and you're sitting in a dispatch center flying, right? Um, current weather systems aren't granular enough. So the picture that the pilot's going to have in that dispatch center may not be accurate. You may think it's accurate, but it may not be. Um, we have limitations in radar, right? We know some radar attenuates, uh, you know, we got, we got uh, evaporative cooling and all kinds of things. So it may not even be raining where the radar is saying it's raining. It may be raining where the radar is saying it's not raining. Um, there's a lot we, you know, I think we have to look at this holistically that our current sensing system is not going to support uh, granularity at the scale that's going to be required to have what I consider productive and efficient PV loss operations, right? So today, you know, from my 35 years experience in the business, right, uh, probably about 40 percent, roughly 30 to 40 percent of all manned aviation missions that are delayed or impacted by what we think is out there in the airspace and weather could have flown. Right. So that just shows you the amount of error we have already in our systems. And some of this is, you know, is there turbulence out there severe? Is there icing out there? You know, our algorithms are not that good. I'm, you know, I'm going to be straight up. I mean, I've been, this has been frustrating to me for 35 years and that's because we don't have data, right? So, you know, the first problem we have is, is that we're going to run models at a higher resolution, but we're not adding new data, right? So all we're doing is moving the deck chairs around, um, you know, visualizations look good, but you know, there's only so much you're going to get out of machine learning if you don't have a training data set to put in there, right? So what we're doing is we're using models as training data sets for models, right? So that's that's the first thing I want to you know put out there is that to solve this problem, we're not going to solve it conventionally the way we've been doing this, right? Uh, and and we're not going to be able to put that on the weather service because they're not going to be able to solve this problem by themselves. And you know I know this because me and you used to talk about many years ago, uh, you know the next gen, which you know I helped write the weather con ops for that in 2005. And we just got our first program out, 
right? For uh, And it's not even getting into the real challenges of resolution. And there's been problems. The Department of Commerce is not going to take on a mission that they're not funded for, as we know. And so we've got to relook at this whole thing, right? So I, I break, I start with that. Now, how do we solve, you know, we're going to start having BV loss missions next year. I'm hoping you guys, you know, we'll get this through here and the rules committee and we'll get out the next guidance on BV loss. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a little concerned that we haven't been discussing weather enough in there. And and the, and so we have this kind of imagination of, of how we're going to do BV loss, but we really don't have a weather solution yet. Now, the answer to that is, there is solutions out there, but we have to look at the way the business model is today, right? And the, you know, first off, we got to get more data, right? We got to get data, and 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 we got to change the standards around certifying instruments uh, versus certifying data uh, standard, right? So one of the things we're working on in ASTM, which I'm leading that weather group, is we want to come back to the rules committee and say, hey, we need to change from certifying instruments for weather to certifying data performance, right? And as you know, Steve, you're a smart guy. <clears throat> you know we have ways of doing that without having to have sensors checking sensors, right? Uh, so that's number one. Number two is we need to um, change the rules around third-party providers, right? Uh, we had a, you know, today the operators are required to certify that a weather company or a third party is EWINS certified. We got to flip that, right? Because we have too many operators now. We don't have like six airlines anymore, right? We, we got lots of OEMs, a lot of operators. So we've got to figure out how to build a system where SDSPs, weather SDSPs, right? Which are in line with the UTM concept that you guys develop, which I love, is we got to federate, you know, we got to, we got to, you know, provide a federated system for weather service providers to contribute, right? And so we got to set the standards and we got to make it easier for these weather companies to play, but still be held to a standard, right? Um, and, and how we do that, who knows, right? We'll, we'll work through that. So we got to get data. We've got to incentivize people. You're on mute, Steve. You've we got to incentivize you're... people. We got to incentivize local state municipalities and private sector to get sensors out there. We yep. got to collect that data. We got to standard. We got to check it against the standard, and we got to make it available. And it, it cannot go back to the big FAA computer in the sky or the National Weather Service computer in the sky because that's another 15-year project, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where so I'm coming. My, my solution to this is that every Don, thank you for articulating what I was trying to hem and haw around. Okay, I know that. That's why I was helping you, and you wanted yeah, to hear so, from somebody else. So, I didn't know if I really wanted to say we need public-private partnerships. We need to embrace the industry. We have to get to performance-based standards um, in everything. Right. I mean, I, I honest to God, I, and I'm sitting here with the PyRep's discussion. There are people who've got mobile mobile apps. They're helping pilots. They, why don't they put PyRep's in their mobile apps and right. and approve that as opposed to me spending all my time trying to figure out how to do natural language processing on voice. But anyways, PK, you, we got we got two minutes and it's all yours. No, no, I, I love Don's passion along with everybody else in, on this Dave's comment. So I, I think we we can modernize it. We need to like a systems view. Pre-departure issues are different than during, you know, in flight, different types of vehicle characterization and they, they impact differently the weather Data. So I think we can do this. Um, love to work with. I mean, I, I think Steve's uh, thought our PPP is great. Uh, I personally, this is my personal opinion. Every post office, we can put a sensor and get whole bunches of post offices are everywhere, including remote places in Alaska. So we we really we can we can make a big difference. You know, the NASA doesn't need to do that. FAA doesn't need to do that. Private industry. Um, can work collaboratively with you guys, you know, with us, and we can uh, set up. We can do the research to figure out how that okay, all gets so, uh, integrated. Uh, so, so, Nancy, before we go, I have to do two things. One, these are all the opinion of Steve Bradford, <laughs> and that's and Steve. That's why I invite you because I know you will share those, <laughs> and I, those are most interesting. What well, and, and, and the uh, funny thing, Steve is not using FA T-shirt. FA logo doesn't even exist. So you know. And um, and I appreciate it because uh, 
Now, if I would have prepared better, I would have had a bunch of slides so we wouldn't have got into this conversation, but I didn't. I, I decided what I wanted to talk about and then we just got into it. But uh, uh, I hope I didn't sound crazy, but I think that I hate to chase trying to improve something that's old. Let's figure out how to improve something new. And I hate to chase how am I going to provide better service as the FIA when I really don't think it's affordable and how are we going to get to performance based and and make this a little bit more open for the new entrants? Because honest to God, it's different between flying to a, something with a strip and flying to a small piece of land, you know, 12 by 12 or 20 by 20 or even 50 by 50. So, OK, Nancy, we'll give it back to you. No, thank, thank you very much. And I thought the part discussion was interesting, too, because there's, I think there's a lot of lessons learned going forward on, on things to do better and, and imply. So, no, I um, appreciate any last questions from anybody before we go to a break? Except for you, Don, no questions from you. No, I just want to say, Steve, I hope I didn't disrupt things too much. I, you know, no, I just no, want no, 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 I appreciate it helping me bail it out with more succinct language. <laughs> and I think we could do this together. I really think the technology's there, the ability to move data around and the standards are there. Everything's there, right? We just got to look at this as a new architecture for the future. I think we could do this. I really do, you know? Yep, I think so too. I'm reading all these comments. I'm being, I'm being schooled at things I know about, but I'm kind of going, really? Really? Once again, we, 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 we chase, we're chasing, I think we're chasing suboptimal solutions sometimes, but that's just me. But Randy, I, I do agree. Randy, I'm glad, glad you and I agree that we need to work together. And with that, we're done. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Steve, PK, thank you. And sincere appreciations again. I do, I do know how busy you guys thank are. You, so Nancy. Thank you for your time. And now, uh, folks, you, we had um, a 20 minute break, and we will be back at um, 1.50. And we'll, this next session will be focused on the research going um, in aviation weather going on across the federal governments, federal agencies. So thanks very much, and we'll see you all back in 20 minutes. Welcome, folks. As, we, as folks come back from the great break, um, I hope you had a chance to recharge or re recaffeinate and uh, or your beverage of choice. Um, I hope folks found, are, uh, learned as much as I did from the first two sessions. I definitely didn't. Um, Anticipate that not many folks were um, were bored, or 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 caught in a couple extra, or did a lot of multitasking, as it were. Um, so with that, we will kick off the second session. We're really looking forward to hearing about the different research and um, efforts going along across the federal agencies. And with that, I will turn it over to Karen Olson from FAA's. Um, I must say, it was a, it's AUS office. My apologies on on that in the. Uh, agenda. So with that, um, Karen, over to you. Great. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, let me pull my slides up here. Give me one second. And are you all able to see this? I just want to. Yes. Yes. They're, um, they're not in presentation mode right now, but we can see them. All right, how about that? Perfect. All right, thank you. Um, so my name is Karen Olson, and I am with the FAA's UAS Integration Office, and I manage the UAS uh, Strategy Planning and Communications Branch within the Research Engineering and Analysis Division. Uh, and we are responsible for working with uh, within lines of business from across the FAA to identify and plan uh, the research that's needed to deliver the data and results needed to inform FAA milestones for UAS integration and advanced air mobility. And so today I will discuss that research strategy and how weather fits into it. Uh, so you can see here, this uh, represents that research strategy for UAS and AAM. Um, and I'm going to briefly walk through this uh, in the interest of time today, but basically the research is phased by operational capability. And you can see those operational capabilities represented on this stair step, starting with ops over people, 
Uh, that operational capability is grayed out because research has, has played its part in informing the ops over people, uh, the final rule earlier this year. Uh, and so in the FAA, we are setting our sights on the more advanced operational capabilities uh, now, including beyond visual line of sight. Uh, this is an agency priority and kind of moving up the staircase, you see the small package delivery, the integrated operations, uh, the routine and scheduled operations, and then the large cargo delivery, uh, followed by uh, passenger transport operations. And it's really in these upper tiers here where we see uh, the strategy extending beyond UAS to include uh, AAM operations uh, with UAM operations as a subset. And so when it comes to research, the research is being identified and classified according to these uh, operational capabilities. And then within the FAA's UAS and AAM uh, research portfolio, we're also implementing a research framework where you have research at the foundation of UAS and AAM integration. Um, and so research is needed in key focus areas to address challenges and to develop products and inform uh, the outcomes needed for integration. And so this framework kind of uh, provides a, a schema for categorizing and classifying research and also in identifying gaps or areas where research is still needed. And so you can see a lot of the technical uh, focus areas listed here. I will point out that weather is one of these uh, key focus areas against which we are uh, prioritizing research within the FAA's UAS and AAM research portfolio. And so within this focus area, um, the weather research uh, informs outcomes such as standards and requirements and capabilities and systems. Um, for example, addressing the impacts of weather on UAS performance or technologies for the identification, distribution and display of weather information. Um, so in terms of uh, research collaboration, this uh, represents our network of internal and external research partners. We have quite a lot of uh, coordination across other government agencies, definitely working on research challenges that are shared uh, by departments across the federal level uh, within several venues, including the UAS Executive Committee and their Science and Research Panel, where the FAA and several uh, other agencies come together to share research and to jointly tackle those UAS uh, integration challenges. We also work with uh, academia through the FAA Center of Excellence for UAS uh, Research or ASHORE and with industry through uh, UAS test sites, uh, through pilot programs uh, and, and interfacing through standards development organizations and uh, we also collaborate on research internationally and hold regular exchanges with other civil aviation authorities um, and other research organizations from across the globe. So when it comes to defining research, um, including weather research within the FAA, of course, as the UAS Integration Office, we must coordinate across the agency, across all lines of business, including uh, aviation safety and the next gen organization, air traffic, uh, airport, security, uh, policy, you name it, really every UAS um, research stakeholder within the FAA, uh, we're interfacing with them on a regular basis, holding regular exchanges and promoting that uh, collaboration, really to understand what are the unique uh, research needs of each office to uh, ultimately plan and identify research to, to provide them with the data that they need to inform their pieces of that UAS integration um, puzzle. So in terms of weather research, uh, definitely collaborating with these stakeholders as well, uh, collaborating with the weather um, community of interest. And so it's really through these exchanges that again, we're able to identify the research and map it back to that UAS and AAM integration research strategy. So here's just a, a summary of some of the research that has been identified as a result of these exchanges. Um, this represents research that is underway or is being planned within the FAA as identified by those sponsoring lines of business, as well as some of our research um, conducted by, by research partners that, that we're tracking. So there are still areas where research is needed, um, particularly in the areas of data collection and analysis uh, capabilities required for each of these operational capabilities. And again, uh, the data from these efforts will go on to inform um, 
inform those those products, those standards, those policy um, and, and other things that the FAA decision makers will need to safely uh, and securely integrate uh, UAS and AAM. So um, I think that's that's about it. Um, and I think you'll hear from some other FAA folks this afternoon on um, some additional weather research. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. Not seeing any in the chat, though. Karen, it seems to me from an outside observer that you're kind of the central coordinating po point within the FAA for aviation weather research. So we are uh, the central point for UAS and AAM research. Um, we're definitely pulling those stakeholders, um, you know, related to all all research needs that will inform UAS, weather definitely being a key um, a key aspect of that. And so, you know, we we definitely uh, um, frequently, you know, collaborate with those weather stakeholders and, you know, they come to our, our roundtable meetings and really exchange the ideas and the, the research priorities and, and have the opportunity to discuss those with other research stakeholders from across the agency. Thank you. Um, a note from Randy in the chat, if you could pull up your last slide again, and a question from Don Birchoff. Yeah, so, oops, am I on? Let's see here. Yeah, so looking at your slide, um, you know, these are all, you know, really important areas. Um, I think what, you know, I think we got to think about here is, you know, how much more research is required to really figure out some of these answers because a lot of folks have been in the field already experiencing what these are. Some of these issues like um, what are the viable meteorological data collection analysis capabilities. I hope, you know, my, my whole focus I think is on how do we get the research programs to focus on the problems that private sector and others can't solve themselves, right? And some of that revolves around um, if we were to say have a data performance standard whether instead of a certified standard what kind of what do we how do we do that what's the research required to understand how we would set, set that up how would we put methods and standards around how that would happen who would do it um how do we allow third-party providers to know that they meet a standard that they can contribute to the ecosystem with UTMs. Um, you know, these are the things that I think we need to get into our research mindset around weather because, um, so again, I, I just, I know research money is limited. Uh, you know, I used to be in the government and I just want to make sure that we're not putting money into research for things we kind of know already, but that we need to solve the bigger issue around how we're going to really build a new system around this whole business model. And how does the government oversee that, ensure it's we're practicing the right standards, validating that what companies are doing is real? You know, we don't want any Tom, Dick, or Harry to be able to develop a, an application that isn't being checked against a standard because we know that, that that could be deadly. So that's kind of my input on this. I just like to see more emphasis on the bigger picture and research required to help really transform the industry like Steve and I were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. That is great uh, input, and we're we're always you know open to you know learning more and hearing more about the ideas and the needs from others within the community. And I would just add that some of these um, uh, do represent kind of uh, summary questions. You know, there's a lot more like detailed research questions within some of these that I think might answer some of those questions. But again, we're we're opening or open to understanding and, and learning more. Um, you know, beyond the FAA community, what what uh, what research needs are are out there. Thanks. Um, uh, Karen, a quick question from Bruce um, Baker in the chat, and then I'll I'll turn it over to um, Kevin Johnston. So the yeah. question from Bruce is, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna ask Jennifer to, uh, I sent her my slide deck, so I'm kind of hoping she can drive. 
Okay, I'll, as Jennifer pulls it up, um, Karen, the question from Bruce Baker was, what is the time frame to begin the BV loss operations for weather research? Yeah, so, I mean, some of that research is uh, underway underway now. I mean, we know the BB loss rulemaking uh, committee uh, is, is actively underway now. Um, and so we've shared uh, with the, the rulemaking committee uh, a lot of the relevant um, beyond visual line of sight uh, research for their consideration. Um, so, you know, within our uh, division, we take a five-year look at these needs and uh, our planning looks at the you know, a rolling five-year window, so it's definitely uh, focused on the near term. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, do you have it or do I need to pull or locate it but and pull it up? I do have Bruce's, but I think next um, we're going Kevin. with Kevin Johnston. Yeah. Yeah, I sent you yeah. Uh, yesterday. Yeah. Oh, sure. I can share it now. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, my presentation is kind of like a, a hybrid, if you will, um, to, to address basically the ses session questions on what research we're doing, because uh, within Randy Bass's Aviation Weather Research Program, we do have uh, some efforts going on that are UAS related, but I was also asked to talk about the weather community of interest and the UAS Special Weather Action Team. So I'm going to tackle both of these topics. So as you heard yesterday, go, to, go ahead to the next slide. Um, from Bill Bauman, uh, he, he talked about the COI and what's the motivation, what's the challenge? Well, across the FAA, we've got a lot of silos of excellence that you know dabble in, in the weather business. So go ahead to the next slide. And you see on the right, <coughs> excuse me, the right side is uh, Bill's uh, weather division within NextGen, but within the ATO on the left side, you just see the green boxes and they deal with a lot of weather acquisition and O&M responsibilities. And then we also have our AFS friends uh, taking on weather issues. And I gotta let my dog out. <laughs> Kevin, we're going to have to add, uh, work with Bill to add AUS to this chart. Well, maybe right. we'll consider it's, that. That's a good point, Nancy. <laughs> All right, next slide. And I think Bill mentioned that there's authority, there's an actual FA order. Oops, going backwards. Um, an FA order that uh, basically has the guidance on what constitutes a community of interest. And did we lose the slides? I think Jennifer might have been trying to go out of, uh, into presentation mode. We lost, yeah, we did lose them. I will get them back. Okay, no problem. Well, and I'll just keep talking because basically, yeah, there's an order that, um, you know, again, establishes the the uh, enterprise architecture board, and Bill has to report up. Um, you know, through that mechanism, on the status of how well his COI is is behaving. Next slide. And yeah, so we've got a charter established. Uh, Paul Fontaine is the executive sponsor. That's Bill's boss. You see the co-chairs and the support for MITRE. Next slide. And the beauty of the, the weather COI is it's very well represented. You see the different uh, components of the FAA and it cuts across really all, all different uh, business lines within the FAA. Next slide. And the red bullets really identify the, the real key uh, purpose, I think, of, of the, the, the weather COI. And again, <laughs> take on the problems, work to resolve them, uh, increase the information flow across the agency uh, through, through collaboration. Next slide. And right now there's uh, eight different SWATs 
and highlighted the wins, standards and policy, and the UAS. So I co-lead the UAS with John Steventon, and he's an AFS 400, but doing a lot of work with the standards and policy um, SWAT that's led by uh, Gordy Rother. Next slide. And just real quick on the SWAT. So we've got uh, three problem statements um, that we're working. Uh, 43 is the standards. Um, and right now that, that's a big deal with uh, analyzed weather um, standards. Uh, you see another bullet there that we're interfacing with the Don's group there with the ASTM F38. We just recently um, had a discussion on the standards work and we uh, decided to continue that um, engagement at, at least on a monthly basis. So I think that's really good. Uh, 44 is basically the weather information gap. So we know that the resolution of the information that's available today really doesn't meet the UAS um, operations. And so we're going to take that on, uh, but we really need to understand uh, those gaps before we figure out really where to, where to apply the research. Uh, one of the things I was surprised that we didn't hear anything from Steve on this morning um, uh, was the development uh, of an enterprise architecture operational improvement and then the supporting activities that would, would enable that for, for qualifying weather information. So again, the concepts are all uh, indicating that we're going to have third weather uh, providers of information through the SDSPs and a new role and responsibility for the FAA will be, you know, oversight of that and how are we going to do it? Well, we've got a multi-year uh, plan basically through this operational improvement to figure out what these processes will look like. Again, I mentioned the interface with the ASTM uh, F38 group, so we'll do that. And we've already identified some what I think are important weather thresholds, and I'm just going to pick on the precipitation intensity. And then and this is through the aircraft certification process. And, and so working with them, um, they've identified a threshold of like rainfall intensity, half an inch uh, per hour. Well, that's pretty interesting because, uh, you know, again, went out, reached back to the weather service and said, hey, do you even you know, look at, evaluate yourself um, for that kind of uh, rainfall intensity. And they come back and said, oh yeah, we do. That's the lower threshold, but it's over six hours. So again, now we're talking over an hour. So is that again, resolution and information that we can take to the table that, you know, would help us uh, hone in on necessary research. Uh, next slide. We lost the slides again. Can you get the last slide up? Will do. And it's just summarized in some research that we've done early on because we really just started funding some UAS focused activities. And just this past uh, summer completed two uh, reports. What I wanted to do since our funding is limited, you know, I wanted to get an understanding of what's going on out there. There is a lot going on through different testing and demonstrations and academia. And so again, not wanting to duplicate anything, I, th I think we wanted to get a feel for, you know, what's the baseline, uh, what's ongoing now. So again, not to duplicate. And so that's been pretty much completed this summer. Uh, our, our first uh, look at looking at, uh, you know, modeling and improving the science. And again, it was good to hear that uh, this this morning it seems like wind is is really the number one issue and concern. So again, we're focusing uh, uh, with MITRE here on micro scale modeling of of wind in in a in an urban environment. And again, we're hoping, uh, well, not hoping, really expecting that the the results will open up doors um, for other functional FA interests. Um, to support uh, the the integrated research that that Karen talked about, and and again, whether it's figuring out what kind of observational weather networks we need, to um, looking at safety scenarios for risk-based assessments, looking at training, and also inform you know the results should be able to inform uh, you know airspace planning and, and infrastructure requirements. And then I also just wanted to mention too that um, the ceiling and visibility product development team within Randy's uh, portfolio 
has an activity ongoing right now where we're actually using drones uh, to sample the atmosphere to improve um, forecasts of fog. And that's in the Cincinnati area. So that's all I had, Nancy. Thank you. Um, questions for Kevin? Kevin, can you talk a little bit about the timeline for the operational improvement? Or right, so it's part of um, the our uh, what we call the next gen segment implementation plan. And you know it's part of our life cycle planning uh, process. Uh, I think it goes out five years at a time. This next cycle actually, uh, this this OI will be uh, approved and submitted part of the, this NSIP plan in February. Um, so we've created some supporting activities already around it and um, and it's it's projected to go out through 2029. So it's kind of a neat process in that again, it rallies around the whole agency around this this you know activity or a series of activities that we, we got to get you know performing to get this operational improvement in place. So again, it's it's this process where we'll figure out how we will provide that oversight of these these uh, third party weather providers. Thank you, hey, Don. To keep on schedule, can I get you to put your question in chat? And I will. Yeah, I was just gonna make a statement. I I really love what. Kevin's group is doing and and Gordy and and John Stevenson um, and I you know I just wanted to say that thank you very much Kevin thank you Karen thank you I think I forgot to thank you and um, with that um, Walter Combs wasn't able to join us so Colleen Ritchie will be cover um, covering the next brief Colleen over to you. Great, thanks, Nancy. One second while I bring up the slides. Let me know when you can see that. Got him. All right, perfect. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Colleen Reiki. Um, I'm going to be talking today about a new prototype camera system that is, is being evaluated uh, by the Alaska Weather Camera Program and, and Walter Combs. Um, and just for a little bit of context, for those of you that may not be familiar, um, the Alaska Weather Camera Program um, has, has basically been around for over 20 years, and it has been providing advisory weather services within the state of Alaska um, in the form of camera sites, uh, several hundred of them actually across the state of Alaska um, at airports, mountain passes, at essentially critical junctures for um, aviation operations that have allowed pilots and, and other operators to uh, essentially look before they fly, and it has had demonstrated um, efficiency and safety gains um, in the state of Alaska. So um, I mentioned today we're going to be talking about a new prototype camera platform that is, is currently being evaluated in the state of Alaska called the Visual Weather Observation System, or the VWAS. Um, and basically, this system en encapsulates both surface sensors as well as 360 degree cameras um, and as i mentioned they're currently being evaluated at four test sites in the state of alaska uh, which are shown on, on the right side um, those of you that may be familiar with some of these sites within the state of alaska may um, note that the palmer airport um, does actually have well, actually let me back up a second so the the ultimate goal with this VWAS evaluation is that um, these systems would essentially augment and supplement the existing ASOS and AWAS network. Um, so the kind of the vision for this is that these systems would uh, provide valuable advisory weather in locations that are currently without uh, either any weather information or without sufficient weather information. Um, so the reason that I wanted to note the Palmer site here, um, which is, is, is located just north of Anchorage, uh, was essentially an initial key site for, for the program, and, and that was the first site that was installed a little over a year ago, um, and essentially deliberately so, since it's in close proximity to the Alaska Weather Camera Program, which is physically located in Anchorage. Um, but also because there is an ASOS at Palmer that essentially allowed for some initial, you know, testing and validation against that system just to, to ensure that accuracy. But the other three sites that you see here are essentially true remote sites within the state of Alaska that currently do not have any 
um, any any type of weather. There's there's no ASOS or AWOS or or other advisory systems. Um, so as I mentioned, the the surface sensors at each of these locations encapsulates several um, key observations, such as surface winds, ceilings, visibility, present weather, etc. Um, the system also contains three stages of, of what are called self checks um, to ensure the the sensor performance. So that ranges anywhere from the, the, the sensors themselves, which are essentially smart sensors, um, which can evaluate their own performance and evaluate voltage and things like that to self-report if, if it's having any kind of issues uh, with performance, all the way to some software that will actually conduct data checks such as range and persistence checks by looking at successive observations from each sensor and evaluating the variability against essentially realistic thresholds to determine if, if there could be a sensor issue, um, if potentially if, if, if the data doesn't look realistic in terms of the temporal variability. Um, during this demonstration, we are engaging heavily with uh, stakeholders within the state of Alaska, uh, which include pilots, dispatchers, as well as the National Weather Service forecasters um, and others. That was just kind of a, a snapshot. Um, so throughout the demonstration, which began in early 2021, uh, roughly the beginning of May, uh, we began to essentially conduct online surveys. Uh, so in, in two forms, one of them being sort of an abbreviated kind of rating system, kind of, you know, only takes a minute or two for the users to respond to and, and gives us insights into the utility of, of various components of the VWAS, um, as well as any issues or, or challenges that they're experiencing. And we also have a more detailed user survey that we've been uh, conducting every few months with them to get more detailed qualitative feedback um, on the performance and the benefits and, and what, which aspects um, are most useful to them. Um, so in terms of timeline, I mentioned that, you know, that this initiative began in early 2021, uh, with the exception being that Palmer site, I mentioned the key site, which was installed in uh, early 2020. Um, and the ultimate goal of this demonstration is to demonstrate the accuracy and operational benefit um, of the system. So we essentially will be and are currently comparing the, the meteorological data that comes out of the, the surface sensors against comparison sources that are in, in close proximity or in some cases far proximity to, um, to these sites, just to confirm the accuracy of the information. Um, I mentioned the, the user surveys that we're using to evaluate the operational benefit. We're also evaluating the system availability and reliability um, at each of the sites. So essentially all of this information is actively being collected and will be rolled up in, into a final report uh, summarizing the performance um, in early 2022. And the ultimate goal there, even beyond once we've demonstrated the accuracy and operational benefit, is to seek additional uh, deployment of, of some of these systems um, in, in other locations in Alaska that are currently underrepresented in terms of weather. So I wanted to just give a, a couple of screenshots here, and this is certainly not holistic. I, I just grabbed a couple components from some of the, the websites just to highlight some of the features. Um, of the system and, and how we're displaying that to the users and some of the things that, that we've heard from the users so far in terms of, of you know, what, what is useful to them. So the image on the left here is, is, is basically one of the 360 degree camera images. I believe this is from the Healy River site. Um, and for those of you not in Alaska, they are have already been getting snow there for the last uh, week or two. Um, so you can see here, obviously I can't click on this, but it is full tilt pan zoom um, in, in terms of, of the, the functionality of, of the camera image. Um, another feature that is useful um, is, is trend information for the surface observations, which I'm showing a snippet of in the bottom right. Um, I mentioned in the previous slide, there are quite a few other observations, both raw observations like temperature and dew point, um, as well as derived products like heat index, wind chill, things like that. Um, but the users have indicated that they they really it, it's really beneficial to have this trend information, which goes back about six hours into the past. Um, so they can look at you know how much variability there is in, in, in certain factors or, or certain um, data fields um, or how steady some of the data fields may be. Uh, and then lastly, in the top right here, 
um, is displaying the fact that the these uh, prototype cameras that are installed now do have sort of night vision um, functionality. And that is something that now that the days are starting to get shorter, especially in Alaska, it's it's dark a lot later in the morning. It gets dark um, earlier in the evening. So this functionality is something that's that's useful to them um, as they're planning. For example, in the morning, while it might still be be dark, and and decisions are needing to be made about being able to um, complete the operations. So that's all I had. And but I think the last thing I wanted to just say is is in terms of kind of turning the corner into a potential future intersection with UAS and UAM. Um, I, I'm sure everybody here can appreciate the potential application of some of these these techniques. But I do want to point out that um, you know the, the vision for this is not necessarily that the FAA Alaska Weather Camera Program is going to go running out and installing these systems, you know, in urban environments and, and, and everywhere to address every need for UAS and UAM. But really, the the vision here is that this demonstration and the current uh, the current instance of this VWAS would essentially be a blueprint for something that industry, other agencies, any anyone else out there in the domain could essentially pick up and provide recommendations for, you know, if I need this kind of information, here's how I could structure it, here's the, the type of information that would be useful, um, the types of systems that I could use, um, et cetera. So thanks so much, and, and I'll, I'll stop here and see if there's any uh, any questions. Colleen, it looks like one from Don, uh, Donald Eck, if I've pronounced that right. Yes, I see that. Will the VWAS system be able to provide a visibility estimate directly? And, and yes, that is correct. So the VWAS system does have a surface sensor um, that directly does provide a visibility measurement. Um, and I will also note that the, I'm not sure if there's other folks that'll be talking about the VIA algorithm or visibility estimate from image detection, um, but essentially that's another capability where visibility estimates in the future uh, will be potentially available from the camera images where basically the algorithm could be run on directly on the camera images to provide a, a secondary uh, visibility estimate to augment the, the actual sensor visibility. Thank you very much. With that, we'll turn it over to Bruce Baker. Bruce, I'll let you um, introduce yourself also as part of it. Okay, yeah, I'm Bruce Baker. I'm with uh, NOAA and it's the Air Resources Laboratory and uh, my lab does a considerable amount of work uh, trying to understand the boundary layer. And in, in, uh, in general, we uh, have started looking at using uh, UASs to probe the boundary layer because there's a definite data gap that can, uh, oh, there's a slide. So uh, when we talk about, when I was looking at this data gap thing, from our perspective, it's really this uh, 10 meter up to probably uh, three or four kilometers. We, there's, a, there's a huge data gap in terms of meteorological uh, information there. And that that uh, that drives a lot of types, a lot of weather, and yet we don't know a lot about it. So we thought that the UAS uh, in itself was a good way to start trying to probe that particular area. And uh, we started back in about 2014 doing this, and we've done a lot of uh, process studies with NOAA. We've looked at had them uh, use UASs to look at uh, formation of tornadoes, uh, severe thunderstorms. Uh, land surface processes that drive uh, weather models and also a uh, fun thing, we actually were able to for use them to help uh, forecast for a balloon festival in Arizona, uh, New Mexico. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, this is what's happened. We, we started out really as sort of nerdy scientists wanting to look at the boundary layer, but we're transitioning now more into trying to understand how can we use these actually operationally to help improve weather forecasts. So We've got a test bed now that's situated uh, just uh, outside our lab. It's near in Knox, near Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, it's going to become a what one is going to be a, really part of a World Meteorological Organization test bed internationally in terms of looking at how to use drones op or how to use UASs operationally. So 
This is where we operate from. Uh, we have a meteorological tower and other ancillary measurements we use to validate measurements, both on fixed wing and rotor aircraft, both of which uh, we can measure wind speed and wind direction with. The next slide. So this is an example of what we do, and we're, we're actually in the middle of doing that now, is we actually, on a daily basis, we go out and do vertical profiles at that particular location. We've got a code to go up to one kilometer. So we've been, but we're still within, we have to be within uh, visual line of sight. So we uh, we have a copter that we fly up and do vertical profiles, uh, starting a little bit before sunrise and go to a little bit after sunset. And we download those data and then the local weather forecast office is able to ingest those into their forecasting display system. Next slide. This is an example of the cross sections that we generate uh, from that, but you can start to see the structure in places that you just couldn't see it before in terms of heating and cooling and how the land surface air, land and air interacting with each other, which ultimately should help uh, hopefully improve uh, some of the weather forecasting. Next, next slide. So uh, we've started this, we just started this over the last year. Uh, we want to expand that to other uh, uh, NWS WFOs. We have a few that have shown interest that are in the eastern region. And the thought is that we want to uh, be able to um, uh, go in and introduce this concept uh, at other, other uh, WFOs. The key there is uh, no one really has that type of information as frequent as you can get, obviously, with these UASs. There's, uh, there's radiosons, but they're launched like twice a day. And they really don't uh, stay right over the, the forecasting area. They're sort of go with where the wind's going. So this whole point is to part, how can we assimilate these UAS OBS and different types of um, forecast models? And the, down at the bottom, we have the high, re high resolution rapid refresh model and a few others that we try to use. Uh, next slide. Here's an example where we actually have used the high resolution refresh model. And we look at, look at how that high split is our dispersion model. So we look at the trajectory of a, of a, of a, re, of a release here, and we look and see what happens uh, if we just use the uh, UAS data, or if we just use the HER model on the right. But we also see that we actually can improve reality if we integrate the uh, UAS data into the model itself. So we're actually working on uh, doing that uh, more frequently, and we also are gonna start interacting with uh, um, the weather service and integrating it more into their into their uh, decision support services system. Next. So next steps, uh, we want to continue doing this routine UAS, uh, UAS profiles along with Raven songs. Continue understanding how we can use the high split uh, and the and the UASs for emergency response of air you know air pollutant dispersion forecasts. But the key here is <clears throat> we really want to try to get it. Um, into a routine operational mode, as opposed to like doing a you know one week or two week experiment and just do a process study, and that's I think where the true utility and importance for these uh, UASs are really going to make a huge difference in uh, in uh, weather forecasts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next step, or I'm sorry, next slide. So I'd say if anything, some of the challenges are really our ability to where we can fly and when we can fly. Uh, we were. We do have a waiver to go up to a kilometer at, at um, Oliver Springs, but uh, really we need to get, probably get up to three, three to five kilometers. Um, they're already doing that in Europe, for example, in Switzerland, they already have um, uh, autonomous flights up to five kilometers on a daily basis uh, for the Swiss Met service. And I think they're gonna end up with a total of like 20 different autonomous sites uh, specifically for uh, improving the, the forecasts. Okay, next, next slide. So we want to continue to support our uh, process studies. I think that's important to help understand how to help with the initialization of the forecast models themselves, <clears throat> but also do this in a routine, op routine mode for uh, how those models work as you move as a function of time. I, I think one of our key uh, things we need to move forward towards is uh, either semi-autonomous or autonomous uh, UASs. Uh, that's critical really to not only reduce the manpower, make it more economical, but also you can do it more frequently and uh, provide a lot more uh, information over time. And 
the obvious one that we want to work with is um, that's the reason I asked the question actually is we really want to get to a point where we can do some safe uh, BV loss ops. Uh, that's also going to be important to go up to some higher altitudes uh, just so we can get more information up around three kilometers. So we want to keep sampling the boundary layer and the weather conditions and try to try to use these in, in our operational sense uh, really to improve the weather model or weather forecast for the for the weather service. I think that might be it. Anyway, so that's what we're interested in. <laughs> Bruce, thank you. Um, question in the chat for, um, for you. Have you explored how to most beneficially sample the atmosphere by UAS depending on a given weather situation? <clears throat> we, uh, well, right now we're, we fly when we can. That's another constraint that we have in terms of winds, fog, clouds, and rain. So we have done some of that when we were doing a, a study in Alabama, looking at the formation of tornadoes in severe weather, where actually was able to stay downstream from the system coming in and do vertical profiles in an area that we thought that that air mass was going to come in and, and kick off some uh, uh, severe weather, and it did. And we could at least map in the moisture fields as they propagated towards the air where they're going to be kicked off. And also what we were able to do, we have a technique to use an IR camera to look at differential heating at the ground, which is a big deal for convection and, and severe storms. And we were able to at least track some of that differential heating and uh, uh, the strength of that to help understand where they might be kicked off. No, thank you. Um, I'm going to key over. There's some um, more questions in the chat. I'm going to key for, if you don't mind taking those over there, and I will um, turn it over to Melissa for her presentation. Okay. But thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, can you see? Let's see. Share. And can you see my screen all right? Yes, and it okay. is, it's now in presentation mode, great. Okay. Hi, my name is Melissa Wagner and today I'll be talking about UAS in assessing severe weather impacts and use in atmospheric profiling. Um, this work is uh, supported by our work in collaboration with the National Severe Storm Laboratory and SIMS recently underwent a name change. We're now the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations. So just to provide an overview of my talk, um, I will discuss uh, UASs and damage assessments and briefly touch upon atmospheric profiling. Most of my work focuses on damage assessments and conclude by uh, talking about some of the future work. So UAS uh, platforms can be very beneficial by assisting uh, National Weather Service weather forecast offices, as well as emergency managers by gaining access in remote locations or inaccessible. In the case of uh, a big events, a tornado outbreak, it can also help uh, in going out and focusing on what should be prioritized. Oftentimes in the case uh, urban damage, uh, a lot of the focus is on that and we can go out and do damage surveys in the rural areas. So this helps with resources and it can also help with disaster response and recovery. With the high resolution imagery, it can help better characterize damage impacts. Um, in particular, multispectral imagery can help detect damage to vegetation that would otherwise go unnoticed. Um, this is based off of the spectral response of uh, vegetation in near infrared bands, uh, red edge, and to a lesser extent, red. So healthy vegetation will have a higher response or higher uh, values compared to stressed or damaged vegetation, which will have uh, lower values. So this, these aspects can really help us improve severe storm climatology, especially in rural locations, as well as help with uh, improving risk and disaster uh, preparedness. And by better documenting uh, high wind uh, impacts, 
and correlating this information with uh, storm signatures that we see in radar, as well as other observation systems, they can, this can help us improve our understanding of severe storm dynamics in the southeast, southeast US and in other areas. So for the damage surveys, we uh, use essentially uh, two platforms. So we use the SkyDO2, which helps us uh, collect aerial photos and videos so we can see the extent of damage. We then have a Quantum Trinity F90 Plus. So this is a fixed wing with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. Um, this uh, allows us to do large scale mapping because it has a battery life of up to 90 minutes. We can map up to 700 hectares on one battery. Um, it is equipped with a red edge um, MX camera, so this allows us to collect the multispectral imagery as well as collect visible imagery at the same time. So this is just an oblique shock of uh, of oblique uh, image of the March 25th Sawyerville, Centerville, Alabama tornado, and this is just showing us some of the uh, tree fall uh, damage. The white box corresponds to the images here on this slide, roughly speaking. So the top image, we can see a true color composite and we can actually see that the it detects this tree fall pattern that we saw in the previous slide. Um, the image in the lower left-hand corner, uh, this is a digital surface uh, model. And so this is essentially showing elevation. So we can see that the areas of trees that weren't affected have higher elevation values shown in the yellow, whereas the areas with the tree fall pattern have uh, lower values shown in the light blue to deep blue. To some extent, some of this is also a function of, of the underlying characteristics. On the right column, we have the multispectral imagery. So here in both slides, the uh, areas of uh, tree damage are captured in the darker gray values, whereas the healthier vegetation is shown in the lighter lighter gray. So the top one is showing a, a normalized difference vegetation index using the near infrared and red bands. The image on, on the bottom right is showing, um, is similar to the NDVI, but instead of using the near infrared band, it shows the red edge band. And this captures a slight more uh, variability in the damage um, based off its sensitivity to chlorophyll content. And this is just another result showing from the previous slide. So this is just taking, uh, showing some of the values that across the across the damage path. So this is a uh, transects uh, extracting values at these points from left to right. And as we can see, with the healthier vegetation shown in in the lighter uh, the lighter gray values, we can see that yes, indeed, it does have. Um, higher index values of about 0.4 to 0.6. And within, within the area of damage, we can see that, uh, yes, it has uh, lower values of about 0.2. Now, some of this is, um, when you're looking at the transects, some of this is also a function of land cover type two. So we do have it in the case of transects two that it is uh, going cross grass, so it does have lower values. Um, the important part of this work too is really the idea of institutional collaboration. So really working with the National Weather Service forecast offices um, in, in the spring of 2021, we coordinated with a, a few of these offices, um, Amarillo, Shreveport, Lake Charles, to name a few. And with this effort, we were able to help um, identify 11 tornadoes or refine uh, some of these damage paths. So as Travis Pot Potter uh, spoke about in the previous uh, session is that this really allows us to do a desktop analysis so we can do a more detailed assessment and help fill in the gaps of, of the ground damage surveys. This, also, this work can also help better address the arbitrary assignment of damage ratings in rural locations. And we really want to be able to work with emergency managers, not just to be able to share the information, but also to be able to coordinate our efforts and be able to gain access into some of these sensitive areas. And if we can share some of this disaster information with those who are effective, they can be able to use this information for insurance purposes. Now, a big component of this work too is really developing 
data sharing and data visualization. When we are working with this data, we're really working with large volumes of data. So we've um, so a big effort that we've done is we've working on developing a near real time image processing. So we've been working with the folks at um, Amazon AWS and we've set up the workflow that's needed to be able to process this imagery and then move it over to um, Esri products for visualization. We also have another effort where we're working in Google Earth Engine Code Editor. So we're similar to the Esri, we can also uh, bring in some of that satellite imagery and ingest our UAS imagery. Um, here in this slide, we can see this is uh, a snippet of the Sawyerville, uh, a, a shot of the Sawyerville tornado. This damaged house corresponds in here to the ortho mosaic and the UAS imagery. And we can see the same red marker in the Sentinel imagery that's, uh, I believe, 10 meter resolution data. So another effort that we have going on, similar to what uh, Bruce Baker had talked about, is really also doing atmospheric profiling. So this is using uh, copter sons to be able to do atmosphere sampling of the boundary layer. So doing vertical profiles to get temperature, relative humidity, pressure, wind speed, wind direction, a few other uh, variables not listed here. The idea is that you know it can help us uh, gain information into pre-storm environments, as well as using this observational data to be uh, ingested into forecast models, and really help with situ situational awareness and and pre-event pre-storm event environments. So, in terms of uh, future work, uh, we do have a big field campaign that will be starting in spring perils where we will be doing uh, using copter sons, uh, radar trucks, a whole host of different observational platforms, as well as having post-event uh, UAS work uh, doing the damage surveys. The idea with the damage surveys is not just really classifying damage, but it's also really trying to gain an insight of the role of land cover in these high wind impacts. And to be able to use some of this information to help uh, assess the land atmospheric interactions. And again, as I kind of discussed a, a little bit, is the idea with atmospheric profiling, really looking at those uh, boundary layer evolutions and dynamics, which can help for modeling, uh, forecasting, and really uh, be a part of observational uh, network. So I'd like to leave. Uh, my contact information up. These are some of the folks that helped uh, participate in the damage uh, survey assessment that we did in the spring. Tony Segalis uh, is really responsible for a lot of the copter sound work as well as Elizabeth Smith and Tyler Bell. Now I open the floor to any questions you may have. Any questions for Melissa? Not seeing, um, not seeing any. Thank you. I hope, um, I hope you're able to stay on a little bit in case somebody does have one in chat. But no, thank you very much and great, inf great and interesting information. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Rubino. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Can you see my slides? <clears throat> yes, they're not quite in presentation mode yet. Up oh, now, they're in presentation mode. Okay, good. So, hello, everybody. I'm Tom Rubino. I'm the TBO Integrated Test Environment Lead. I work at the William J. Hughes Technical Center at the Atlantic City Airport in New Jersey. And for those of you that don't know about the technical center, it's where we do our, our primary place for research and development, test and evaluation. So we have a lot of labs. Uh, I'm going to discuss uh, a weather simulation tool suite today um, that we call Weather Information Services for Enterprise Research or affectionately WISER. Uh, we discovered we needed this tool uh, in preparation for testing trajectory-based operations. Uh, I 
I'm going to share with you a little bit about the tool. I think you could see it. You'll be able to see its applicability towards AAM. And then I do have a slide on some work we're getting into uh, for advanced air mobility. Just quick background. Uh, a few years ago, we were asked to make sure we were ready to uh, the test environments were ready for trajectory based operations. Uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar with TBO, it brings a set of oper groups of operational improvements to, um, to areas of the country that can use them the most. So their implementation, the TBO implementation plan was to uh, uh, deploy TBO operational improvements to different regions. And, and and the regions were quite large. They divided up the country basically into eight uh, operating areas, as they call them. And uh, the end result from a test point of view was that we had to uh, be able to create a test environment that was larger than we're typically used to testing uh, at the technical center. Uh, and, and so there were uh, gaps that we uh, discovered. Ironically, uh, the weather simulation capability was the number one gap. We thought it, we had very limited capabilities to simulate weather scenarios in this enterprise environment. Um, uh, and 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 the gap is significant because most of the benefits that TBO brings uh, occur during weather situa situations. So uh, the solution, uh, as we got into our implementation plan, the solution we discovered was the tool called Wiser being designed by our aviation weather branch at the technical center. Uh, and the next few slides I'm going to uh, describe it in a little more detail so you get the gist of why it's important to us. So Wiser, as it says there, is a microservice framework. It, it, it has several functions. I'm going to discuss two that are important to us in the in the simulation world. That's the weather information management capability and the weather, weather enterprise uh, playback. Um, for WIM, it's basically our, our functionality that collects the data, archives it, and allows us to create weather cases that we can um, used for specific air traffic scenarios and we can build those weather cases and 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 store them in a library uh, for the test community to use the weather enterprise playback capability uh, is the the tool that allows us to integrate and and inject those weather cases into our uh, simulation environments so um just so you get the full effect we we envision you know we have uh in in the the weather information management uh laboratory uh it's ingesting routinely weather it has tools for us to develop weather cases uh in, in particular um you know the test community has all different uh requirements on where and, and and what type of scenarios they're going to have to develop we needed a, a an intelligent search capability that allow the uh the the folks the test community that aren't that savvy and under and understand weather uh to be able to search through and develop these test cases uh we rely heavily on our target generator facility group they are uh are experts in scenario uh, development for air traffic control scenarios. Uh, so they are the main users of this tool in creating uh, these weather cases. Here's just a quick picture on the left shows some of the sensors that uh, WIM pulls in and, and archives and some of the tools uh, that uh, the TGF folks will use to to create the weather cases. They will eventually uh, integrate them with the air traffic scenarios, so uh, they play out in our test environment uh, the way we need them to. 
weather playback capability again is um, the ability of the tool to be integrated into different labs. We are, like I, I mentioned before, we're developing this now. We have it integrated into a few labs, not all, uh, but the use of it is uh, well, um, is very uh, fondly accepted and uh, they're, they're using it and want it to want us to rush up the rush to development as, as soon as possible. Um, one of the things that the playback function has to do, if you could imagine a lot of the data that we or all the data that we collect is is um, from live uh, live data around the country at different times when we want to play it in a scenario or a simulation scenario, it needs to be reclocked. That's one of the functions uh, that web takes care of. It also has to be formatted for each of the systems that are part of the simulation. So our um, in route automation system ERAM, our terminal automation system STARS, our decision support systems TBFM, all a lot of them take the same weather, but it's all formatted differently. And uh, that you know, in the past, when we tried to do this on single systems, uh, was very time consuming. And this tool uh, is and will continue to, as they develop it, be just invaluable for for um, including weather into our scenarios. Again, here's just the picture showing uh, TGF uh, injecting the weather combined integrated weather air traffic control systems to the various labs that we have. Now I'm going to switch to, uh, again, this is our TBO lab environment on the left, and we're, we have just about a year ago uh, um, became involved in an interagency agreement with uh, NASA Langley, uh, and the goal was to integrate uh, their AAM advanced air mobility assets with our uh, TBO integrated test environment. Uh, we're progressing well in that effort. Um, just just to go around this picture, and this is um, second to the last slide, just so you know, the uh, the TBO. Uh, Integrated test environment here is adapted for our Atlantic City Airport. Um, when we run tests with NASA Langley, we um, can see their traffic as well as the traffic that we generated on our STARS automation. That's our Tracon, our terminal automation system. We can also see it in our out the window lab, which is a tower simulation lab. So you can see the uh, the traffic that we're generating, and it's quite interesting and exciting actually, because you can see the UAM vehicles that um, are being flown. Uh, they are simulators that NASA Langley has. They call them the UAM flyer. You can see them flying off of the parking garage. We converted it to a vertiport. Um, that is at the tech at, at the Atlantic City Airport. You can see it from the tower view, and as it departs and, and, and goes off to Atlantic City. Um, similarly, from the UAM flyer, uh, they can see the 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 air traffic in their out the window display in that in that simulated vehicle as well. So they could see the commercial traffic that we are generating in our lab. That is departing and arriving at Atlantic City Airport. So, um, you know, the, the down at the bottom, kind of hidden away a little bit is one of the, the lab gaps that we think is a, is a big one. We need micro weather services, I guess, as part of the SDSP. Um, we have yet to find um, a tool to help us simulate that capability, and when and when and when we do find it, we will also need to have it integrated with our 
uh, wiser capability as well, because you know when you run a simulation in this environment, you're going to need to have it all um, coordinated and have it displaying the same weather throughout from all points of view. Albeit the uh, micro weather will be be different for and and used differently in, in the UAM side of the world, but um, this environment uh, is a good place to to work on understanding what's needed and um, and right now we just know we need it. So that's it. I have the last slide is just you know a plug for the aviation weather branch that those are the developers of the wiser tool here are just some of the other things that they're involved with and uh some of the key contacts uh from that branch Nancy. tom thank you very much um questions for tom Not seeing any. I will put a plug. Um, we are going to take the slides and put them alongside the recording um, that FPA will be putting up on their site for us. So um, thank you for having your contact information in there again. Um, is David Wagner online? I don't see him. In Hello. The yes. List, but I could. Up oh, there you are. All right. David, uh, do you see? You. Do you see the slide? Yes. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Hi, I'm and David Wagner. Hey David, I'm running yes. just a touch behind. So if you can mm -hmm. help me out, it'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, fine. I will see what I can do. I have a, a whole lot of one slide here to talk through. Um, I'm here on, on behalf of Convergent Aeronautics Solutions, who I've been working with and the project in the lower right, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, here at NASA, we took a look at urban air mobility, weather tower and operations uh, to uh, uh, Problem, problem areas in that space, uh, that of micro weather, which is what I'm focusing on here, and also weather tolerant operations in public spaces. Uh, the goal of uh, CAS is to find more transformative solutions that are both desirable, stuff that people actually want, viable things that are affordable and people can are willing to pay for, and feasible things that are actually possible. We're customer focused, problem focused, open aperture. We take a look at all the stakeholders, do uh, one or two months of basically structured brainstorming with a, a lot of good uh, brains in the room to uh, look for what we like to call problems in the wicked quadrant. Uh, problems that are both have novel potential solutions or perhaps no known, currently known solutions and problems that really need solutions that have not been characterized. So they're uncharacterized, new ideas. And when we took a look at weather tolerant operations and micro weather, we found uh, two of those wicked kind of problems. Uh, one of them has been moved into a related ongoing project. And this one is looking at filling that gap that you all have been talking about for a while in getting higher resolution uh, weather data. I believe part, uh, these uh, projects are both in the planning phase, so I don't have a lot of details on partners and timelines quite yet. Um, but the uh, first ubiquitous weather sensing is looking at uh, uh, the original vision was looking at a sensor package that is a small, lightweight, low power, and is still going to get the kind of uh, uh, with a kind of small scale weather data that is needed to support micro weather now casting and forecasting and Grady Cott. Grady Koch is the contact for the, that uh, project. Uh, mine is looking a little bit further in the future. We're trying to focusing, especially in CAS, on the uh, urban air mobility level uh, transition to five and six when things get really busy and realize that by the time we get there, the wind flows in a lot of cities just are not as, as the cities are designed and the buildings are shaped, uh, going to be amenable to that level of operation in all cases. And we want to see, well, what is it that's causing those the problematic wind flows? Well, it's it's uh, city planning where buildings are and the shapes of those buildings. And it turns out that you know we can do something about that. We have a history in the United States of designing cities and architecture around our transportation system. Think about where parking garages integrated into buildings. Um, city planning laid out in, in grids for the roads. We're likely to be doing that as we get start getting more and more urban air mobility operations going. And so we're doing some really going to be doing some really early, early research to see if we can get uh, 
the micro local very localized micro weather moderated um, likely to starting very near the vertiports but outside the fence line uh, to see if we can improve conditions for approach and landing um, that's pretty much it in a nutshell if you all have any other really uh, interesting research areas that are kind of further term a lot farther out there I encourage you to talk with Keith Wickman or Jessica Reinhardt at uh, uh, the CAS project um, and if you are interested since we are looking for partners um, right now in this planning phase uh, in either of the micro weather moderation or because weather sensing to contact me David Wagner or Grady Cock. And thank you. Questions? Oh, no. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, question, um, questions for David. I'll pause a little longer than I missed one from top for, uh, for Tom in the last one. Um, looks, looks like you've got one, uh, one ask for more or for uh, further collaboration. 